Good morning, everyone. This is Christina Osborne from ISO Stakeholder Affairs, and I'd like to welcome you to day one of the EIN Resource Efficiency Evaluation Enhancements Workshop. Uh, this is a two-day workshop, so the next one will is scheduled for uh, this coming Monday. Uh, details can be found on our public calendar as well as the initiative webpage. Um, there you'll also find the workshop presentation, issue paper, and other related information. Uh, the presentations were posted late Wednesday, and since that time, um, there were updates to the ISO and Portland General general presentation, so um, please check the webpage for those updated versions. Uh, the ISO presentation was posted yesterday, and then I posted the Portland General presentation earlier this month. Uh, so when we announced this workshop back in May, we did invite stakeholders to contact us if they wanted to present their perspectives on the issues described in the paper and potential design solutions. So we did receive interest from the EIM enemies um, here to present on their behalf. We have Jeff Spires from PowerX, Gary Nolan from APS, Justin Herrick from Portland General, and Mark Simmons from BPA. Let's go to the uh, agenda for today. Uh, so first, Danny Johnson, who is from uh, ISO Policy, he's going to review the uh, resource efficiency evaluation design principles, followed by Gary Nolan, who will present the principles um, from the perspectives of the EIM entities. And then Danny will discuss the potential design ch uh, changes, and then Jeff Spires will present specific enhancements to improve uh, resource accuracy of the uh, resource efficiency evaluation. So other representatives from the ISO who are here to provide support, uh, we have Don Trethaway, Brad Cooper, Greg Cook, Robert Fisher, Guillermo Batista Alderet, Rahul Kalaskar, and John Anders. And also um, on the line from the EIM entities, uh, we have Laura Choli uh, from BPA. So we have uh, made an improvement to our stakeholder process <laughs> um, by adding an optional working group early on in the policy development phase. Uh, this would be primarily for initiatives that would benefit from upfront stakeholder input on the scope of issues to be addressed in the initiative. And we do believe this is a more collaborative approach that will help lead to more alignment of the proposed design. Um, a working group isn't necessarily necessary for every initiative, but just those that are uh, more complex. So we are going to take questions, stop the questions kind of throughout the presentation. You can either ask the question verbally, uh, so press pound two to raise your hand and enter the queue, or you're welcome to send me, uh, your questions to me via that chat. Um, we are also recording the meeting today, and we'll post the video file um, on the initial webpage along with the other materials. So with that, I'll we'll turn it over to our first speaker, Danny Johnson. Yes, thank you, Christina. So. Before we get started, I wanted to take a minute and talk about the genesis and the purpose and the scope of this initiative. Last winter and spring, the CAISO had a stakeholder initiative that conducted a review of our market rules using some of the lessons learned from August 2020 in an attempt to better prepare for operations this summer of 2021. As part of that initiative, the EIM resource efficiency evaluation was discussed and while we did make some changes, the largest being the inclusion of uncertainty in the bid range capacity test, a lot of the topics that were discussed uh, were more complicated and needed more stakeholdering and a longer implementation time than we thought could be accommodated to get in place by that summer of 2021 deadline. So as a result, we decided to have this initiative to follow up on a lot of those ideas that were discussed. Uh, which is why we're all here today. So uh, the first slide that we have here is the purpose and scope of this initiative. And on this, I did want to, before we talk about the, the purpose and scope of this initiative, is to get into really one of the foundational principles of the EIM that I think is worth remembering prior to having this discussion today, and that is that the EIM is a voluntary market and all of the existing design we have for the RFC is based on that premise that it is voluntary. And so any changes I think that we would look to make to the RFC should have that uh, being considered and what those changes end up being. With all that being said, the purpose and scope of this initiative would be to explore additional improvements to the um, resource efficiency evaluation. These would include applying possibly the balancing test to the case of BAA, potential design modifications to the capacity test and the flexible ramping sufficiency test, 
trying to talk through how we may want to account for emergency operator actions within the RFC to the extent that these actions would be expected to free of capacity that is able to be dispatched through the EIM. And then finally, to talk through financial consequences for failure of either the capacity or the ramping sufficiency test. Uh, next slide, Christina. So these are what the ISO believes would be the generally accepted principles uh, for the resource efficiency evaluation test. The first is that leaning its participation in the EAM without sufficient capacity or capability to meet expected load. The second would be that the resource efficiency evaluation should measure the capacity and ramping capability of a balancing authority area. The third is that consequences of the resource efficiency evaluation failure should not cause operational or reliability issues. And the final principle would be that the resource efficiency evaluation does not dictate resource adequacy or integrated resource plans in individual balancing authority areas. Rather, it is simply a look at the upcoming hour ahead if each BAA has sufficient capacity and flexibility to meet their demand and flexible ramping requirements in that hour ahead period. So I think the next slide is the EAM entities talking about what they would view as the uh, generally accepted principles for the RFC. And I think following that would be the correct time to kind of open up a discussion between us and any stakeholders to see if there are any differences of opinions and then uh, to try to work through those differences of opinion and see if we can come up with a common, or a common understanding of the principles. So I'd like to turn it over to Gary. And Gary, you may need to unmute. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah, thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, uh, and thank you for allowing me to present on this important topic. Uh, my name is Gary Nolan. I'm a regulatory advisor for Arizona Public Service. Uh, me and my colleagues are not speaking formally on behalf of all of the EIM entities. As a diverse group of participants, there has not been adequate time to coalesce on all of the details that this initiative encompasses. But the concepts and thoughts are generally shared by a good number of the entities. We look forward to engaging in this topic uh, much further and giving it the detailed attention that it deserves. We appreciate the opportunity to share our ideas on how to improve the Western energy imbalance market. The EIM has been an exceptional success story of demonstrating how Western entities can embrace regional market components when given the opportunity to adopt them gradually and cost effectively so as not to negatively impact our customers' rates. And as the EIM has grown, we see that now is the time to apply more rigor to the rules that govern participation. With greater number of members, resources, and loads, the opportunity for greater savings is evident, but so is the chance for imprecise evaluations to create significant problems. Next slide, please. So over the course of the next couple of days, uh, me and my colleagues will be providing input on the following topics. The principles for the resource efficiency evaluation, additional transparency, oversight, and reporting, specific enhancements to improve the accuracy of the RSE, and failure consequences, and the opportunity for the EIM emergency assistance. Next slide, please. So we too feel it's very important to focus on the principles of what EIM should achieve. These principles are fundamental and foundational, and not surprising, they are also the principles that the EIM entities presented when discussing what an extended day ahead market should achieve. And this morning, I'm encouraged that the principles provided by the ISO this morning greatly align with ours. And they are to maintain reliability while discouraging leaning, developing a capacity test that is accurate, effective, and equitably applied. Ensure the test is properly assessing each balancing authority's abilities to meet its obligations on a standalone basis, net of its diversity benefits. Full transparency and ongoing review and designing a simple and effective failure consequence that upholds both reliability and equitable commercial outcomes. We look forward to the discussion today and Monday. We're confident we can find the solutions that are necessary to improve the EIM and allow it to function well and continue to provide its diversity benefits, increased renewable integration, and cost savings. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Gary. 
I think um, we can go ahead and take questions. Again, if you want to ask your question verbally, press pound two, or feel free to send it to me um, in the chat. And let me know if you want to go back to the ISO uh, slide on principles or if you have a question on this slide. I do see okay. one question in the phone queue. Okay, thank you. Caller, please go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Yeah, I'll just get, get kind of one question or, or maybe two points. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think the, the principle of the RSE when it was established back in 2014 was to maintain reliability. It, it really is simply about not leaning. And I, I, and I think we should maintain that principle and I think it's particularly important. The reliability stays with the, the BA. And as was pointed out earlier, it's um, um, it's a voluntary market. And the second point as we get through this, um, I, I think we, we talk about enhancing the capacity to um, I, I, I would always wonder if we're better off combining the capacity and the flex test because uh, I don't know of many instances, if any, where an entity has failed the flex test uh, and not uh, failed the capacity test. Uh, so we, we may want to, instead of um, looking for further improvements in the capacity test, um, I actually maybe look to combine the uh, capacity and flex. Thanks. And I didn't catch your name. Sure, Kelly for Los Angeles. Thank you. Anybody else in the queue, Shreya? Or? I do not see any further questions in the queue as of now. I do have, um, there is a question in the chat from Steve Kearns from uh, TGP. Unfortunately, I cannot ask, oh, sorry. Uh, this is the uh, question is whether or not uh, there should be a principle that all uh, tests should be consistently applied to all market participants. So this is Danny at the ISO. I think that where we can, I think that we would want to consistently apply all tests. It, it is a little bit of a struggle just due to the inherent differences between the CAISO's existing market processes that feed into the RSC and the base scheduling process that EIM entities utilize. I do think that we bring up and have slides talking about possibly contemplating if the penalties for failure of the balancing test would be appropriate to apply to the ISO, even though the spirit and the intent of the balancing test isn't really something that the ISO, it, the behavior that test tries to ensure isn't something the ISO can really easily do with our market processes, but I think that's something we'd be open to discussing. Beyond that, I'm, I think that the tests are fairly evenly applied to both the CAISO and EIM entities. You said thank you. Uh, anybody else in the queue, Sharia? I do not see any uh, questions in the queue as of now. Christina, it's Jeff Spires here from PowerX. Um, can I just uh, respond to the, the previous comment and discussion between Absolutely. Danny and Steve? Uh, I, yeah, I think uh, uh, Steve Kearns raises a, a good point, and I, I think it's somewhat um, in our principles, um, maybe not as clearly laid out as it could be, but I think consistent application of the resource efficiency tests as a general principle is really an important one. I think uh, you know, Danny's point about there are differences, um, particularly with respect to the California ISO and, and the way that the test is applied to the CAISO BAA um, may need to have some, some differences in terms of the, the details to reflect that difference. But I think, you know, despite the, the potential to have um, unique approaches in terms of the details, I think at a high level, the objective that we're really seeking is consistent application in terms of 
confidence amongst the group that the resource efficiency evaluations are uh, are accurately measuring all of the BAs, including the CAISO, as well as the other EIM entity BAs, uh, whether the tests are accurately measuring their sufficiency and whether the outcomes, um, for example, associated with the failure consequences are equitable and fair across all those entities. And so I think there is room for us to acknowledge that there may be differences and that we need to uh, have details that reflect the CAISO's unique situation, but continue to be striving for consistency in terms of the way that the, the test is ultimately applied to all of the EIM participants. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions for Jeff or comments? Again, press pound two to raise your hand, and just a reminder to introduce yourself first. Do we have anybody in the queue, Shreya? I do not see any questions in the queue as of now. Uh, sorry, Christina, just now I uh, see a raised hand in the queue. Great, thank Call you. Up. Sure. Caller, please go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Hi, this is Steve Keen from Central Coast Community Energy. Um, just following up on that, I mean, I, I think that the caller's point that the CAISO is in a different position needs, you know, that needs to be considered too. Because while these are rules that are set up for EIM entities to ensure that they have sufficient resources, it's a very different situation with the CAISO. If you're a generator in the CAISO or a transmission owner in the CAISO, you're, you have to go through the CAISO. You know, you have to be part of the market. If you want to sell your power, you have to be part of the market. If you have transmission, it's in that market. That's not the case for the EIM entities, right? They can decide each hour what generation and what transmission is in, the, in that market. That puts them in a very different position. And I think, you know, as Jeff was saying, yeah, we should strive to be, to treat everybody equally. But you have to remember that, you know, the structure does not treat everybody equally. And to a large extent, the reason EIM works in these other areas, it relies on the fact that there is a strong market in the CAISO. And that's kind of what drives the rest of EIM. And I don't think that can be, I think we have to keep that in mind. Thank you for that. Thanks, Steve. So this is Danny again, and I think I would, I would agree with that, but I'd also agree with Jeff. I think to the extent that we can mesh the inherent differences between the CAISO process and the EIM-based scheduling process, we want to, to try to ensure that these tests are applied as, as accurately and equitably as possible. One thing I wanted to follow up with the EIM entities, I think it was made by the first caller from, a point made by the first caller from LADWP is that comment on reliability. I think the CAISA's position would also agree with him that reliability still is the responsible of the BAA. And while the participation in the EIM shouldn't hurt reliability, that it wouldn't be the responsibility of the RSC to ensure that each BAA can operate reliably. Is that something you would, uh, is there anybody who'd be interested in commenting on that? Again, press down two to raise your hand. Do you see anybody in the queue, Shreya? I do not see any questions in the queue as of now. Danny, it's, it's Jeff Spires again. I, I think that that's, um, that's a, a good clarification. I think we, we understand, I think I can speak on behalf of the EIM group, that we understand that the reliability function um, stays with the BAs and um, that it, it doesn't you know, specifically fall to the resource efficiency test. So it probably is better to characterize it as we want it to be consistent with reliability and 
and not you know create new challenges. But uh, but I think that's a fair comment that it's the way that our principles are worded so far might be um, assign too much responsibility on the test itself associated with reliability. Thanks, Jeff. I'm, I'm glad we have alignment there. Anybody in the queue, Andrea? Yeah. I don't see any callers in the queue as of now. Sorry, Danny, I cut you off. Go ahead. No, I was just going to ask you to check if there's anybody else who okay. would like to chime in on the principles. Give it a moment. Again, press pound two to raise your hand, or you can send it uh, to me in chat. I do not see any callers in the queue as of now. Any comments from uh, yeah, amenities or ISO before we move on? Okay. All right, well, I'll go ahead and move on then. So during this next section, I wanted to provide a real high-level overview of the current EIM design with more of a focus on the intent and the objective of each test rather than kind of going through the mechanics of how each test is implemented. For additional details on that, I'd ask that you either refer to the issue paper or any of the presentations made by Guillermo and Rahul and their market analysis team during that summer of 2021 enhancements initiative or any of the MSC meetings on which this topic was discussed since the mechanics of these tests and how they're implemented was discussed in depth on those processes. So next slide, Christina. So while we do, yes, yeah, yeah, thank you, Christina. While we do have a lot of presentations on the implementation, I did think it was worthwhile to note that the existing design has undergone a significant evolution since its initial inception. All of these changes were stakeholdered through the EIM process and made with input from or at the request of EIM entities and stakeholders. I think of these changes, the most significant was probably the move to evaluate each 15 minute interval independently rather than hourly. Uh, falling out of this change was also the decision to limit transfers to the most uh, recently passed 15 minute interval rather than hour. A change was also made to include an adder on the capacity test that reflects historic intertight schedule changes between the final T RSE conducted at T40 and the T20 tagging deadline. This was done to ensure that any schedule changes that would be occurring between these two time intervals would be captured such that uh, schedules that were shown for the purpose of the RSC couldn't be artificially systemically inflated for the purpose of passing the RSC. So this was our attempt to address that. Uh, there's also been changes to lock the load and variable energy forecasts prior to the T55 evaluation. We got feedback from EIM entities that the base scheduling process was a little bit of a moving target with the different iterations of the RSC and curing periods. This move uh, reduced a couple of the variables that feed into that moving target and hopefully made the test a little bit more straightforward to pass. I'd like to add that the CAISO also recently completed an initiative to create an additional RSC at T30. This would become the final financially binding initiative and the T40 RSC would be retained as advisory. The benefit to this is the same initial reference point from a market solution would be used in both of these, which further serves to reduce the, the variables that feed into that moving target that, that EAM entities are trying to base schedule to. And then a f additional change was uh, we put a tolerance band on the flexible ramping test, which is the greater of one megawatt or 1%. And this was done to ensure that entities aren't precluded from participating in the EIM and realizing its benefits due to a failure due to what is really like an inconsequential amount of flexibility. Next slide, Christina. So at a real high level, the RSC is composed of four tests, 
the feasibility test, the balancing test, the capacity test, and the flexibility test. It's currently run three times at 75, 55, and 40 minutes prior to the upcoming hour. Again, that 75 and 55 minute test or advisory, their results are posted. It allows EIM entities a curing period to update their base schedules prior to the next test with the idea being that the final financially binding uh, test at T40 is more accurate. Failure consequences of the capacity and the flexible ramping sufficiency test will result in limiting additional incremental EIM transfers. And I think to the point that was previously made, the, the feasibility and balancing tests are not applied to the CAISO BAA. This is done, or this was done, uh, what we thought was equitably just due to inherent differences that our market process is take care of some of the objectives of what these tests are trying to do and that they wouldn't need to be applied to the case of BA. Next slide. So taking a step back and trying to look at the purpose of what these four tests are, the first, uh, the first point I'd like to make is that the capacity and flexibility tests are really designed to ensure that each EIM entity is able to meet their demand with their own net supply prior to engaging in transfers with other BAAs. This gets back to one of those principles that each participant should be able to meet their own net supply. So it ensures that you have the capacity that's required to meet forecasted demand and uncertainty and the flexibility necessary to ramp to 15 minute demand variations within the hour. The next two tests, the balancing and feasibility tests provide incentive for an EIM entity to submit uh, balanced schedules. And they also provide EIM entities information about potential congestion within their BAA to let them try to adjust and not have that congestion be realized uh, when the actual market is run. So the capacity test determines whether a balancing authority area is participating in the EIM with sufficient supply it calculates the capacity by determining if the total bid range offered is greater than the total requirement. If the bid range is greater than that requirement, the balancing authority area would pass the test. This test is applied equally to EAM entities and the CAISO, so EAM transfers, both imports and exports, and temporal constraints are not included in this test. And really, the way we kind of thought about this test is that this was somewhat of a filter for the complementary more robust flexible ramp sufficiency test, which is what tests if the units can actually be where they need to be in that operating hour. So the way this was set up is that if a BAA were to fail this test, then they would also fail the flexible sufficiency test for that same interval in the same direction. So it, it actually served as a filter. Next slide. So moving on to the flexibility test, uh, this ensures BAAs have sufficient ramping capability to meet load forecast change and uncertainty inherent to both load and renewable performance. This test evaluates four ramping intervals from an initial reference point at seven and a half minutes prior to the upcoming operating hour. So it measures that seven and a half minutes prior to the midpoint of each of the four 15 minute intervals in the upcoming hour and it does this to try to determine if a BA has upward and downward flexibility uh, to meet potential real-time dispatch requirements. Next slide. A little bit more detail on this. Uh, there are six different inputs into this. This is, this, as Rahul explained back in January, this test is actually fairly complicated and fairly involved. It includes the net demand uncertainty, uh, forecasted change in demand, and also the diversity benefit, the net import and export capability, and the flex ramp credit. All of these things feed into this test, which the amount of different variables that feed into this is what makes it a little bit more complicated to pass, maybe than the capacity test. Next slide. So the balancing test uh, was designed to provide a financial incentive for EIM BAAs to provide uh, updated base schedules near forecasted demand. There is the potential for the base scheduling process to be misused as a means to manipulate EAM results. This could be done to avoid decommitting generation and avoiding the subsequent startup costs by providing base schedules in excess of forecasted demand. There are also gaming opportunities via imbalance charges. 
to the extent that systemic differences in LMP are present. So what this test does is it compares the EIMBA's base schedules to a demand forecast and determines hourly imbalances. For the KISO, our day ahead market results, HASP, and RTPD processes are designed to commit supply equal to forecasted demand. The fact that these processes are automated doesn't give the KISO the same ability to intentionally uh, submit inaccurate schedules and potentially realize benefit from those imbalanced schedules. So that was the original reason why this wasn't applied to the KISO. Next slide. So what those penalties are and how this test works, uh, an EAMBA can choose to use the CAISO's demand forecast or use their own forecast. If a EAMBA elects to use the CAISO's demand forecast and the base schedules are within 1% of that forecast, they would be considered as passing the test. Should they elect to use their own demand forecast or their imbalances be outside of that 1% of the CAISO's uh, forecast, then they would be subject to an over and under scheduling test with penalties applied if the actual uh, load de meter deviation is greater than 5%, there's one tier of penalties, and there's a second set of penalties if it's greater than 10% off its base scheduled value. The final test is the feasibility test. This is really EIM-centric. We perform a power flow on the submitted base schedules at T75 and T55 to determine if the schedules would result in violations of transmission limits. Those results are posted. The EIM entity would have a curing period and an opportunity to adjust base schedules to resolve those advisory violations. And then this test isn't explicitly applied to the KISO BAA, but it in some ways is implicitly implied or in some ways automatically implied due to our market process being designed to automatically resolve these transmission violations. So we don't have the curing period to manually resolve them. Our processes would uh, try to automatically resolve them. So I'd like to pause and see if we have any questions on what the objectives in general are of the existing RFC design. Any questions or comments? So again, press pound two to raise your hand or send me a question in the chat. Anybody on the speaker line have a question or comment? Sharice, do I have see, in the queue? Yes, I just now see a caller in the queue. Okay. Caller, please go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Hi, Dan Williams from Customized Energy Solutions. So um, just maybe bookmark this question. I don't know if you're planning on covering it, maybe at some other point, but um, you know, over a few days last week, uh, the KISO failed the, or I guess had a uh, power balance and feasibility in the RUC process. And I'm just curious if, if you've had any discussion about what that implies relative to the uh, balancing test and kind of some of the statements that were made on that uh, slide. Yeah. I. I think, Dan, that we do talk about this later in the potential design changes to the RFC, and that is something that we recognize is the fact that the KISO can have infeasible power balance constraint relaxations due to, due to infeasibilities and a lack of supply if, if the financial consequences that are baked into the balancing test and the over and under scheduling test should be applied to the KISO, even if, even if we don't have the same incentive to equitably apply the test to all EIM participants should these also be applied to the kite. So it's something we are thinking about and we're looking for more feedback for a little bit later in the presentation from the broader stakeholder community. Yeah, this is Brad. This is Brad. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, I'd add that I, I don't think, uh, I agree with Danny's comment that we should consider what happens if we have a power balance and feasibility in the real time market. But I, I don't think the, uh, the power balance and feasibility in, in RUC is applicable to this because uh, what happened there is, I'm not completely up on the details of, of last week, but what happens there is we curtail exports and bring us back into balance. Uh, but, but I do agree that's something we should consider. 
uh, if, if it occurs in the real-time market. Yeah, thanks, Brett. That's the other thing I was going to point out is that those those RUC results for the ISO feed into that T75 advisory test. So to the extent that we would have an unbalanced schedule, it would be the same as a, a EIM entity submitting an unbalanced schedule. Like the real – where the rubber meets the road is at that final financially binding schedule is a balanced to demand. Thanks. I guess part of the question was just kind of uh... – you know, trying to follow up on some of the discussion of what happened last week and kind of see, um, you know, what what actions does the CAISO take if you're uh, infeasible in RUC and you've curtailed all export schedules that can be curtailed? Um, at, how does that affect your positioning going into um, going into the real time market? You know, do you, do you take additional actions to exceptionally dispatch resources? Uh, coming out of RUC or, you know, what happens if you run out of RUC availability bids, you know, those sorts of things that um, I guess they're edge cases, uh, certainly, but just was curious if you'd be kind of uh, unpacking that a little bit more further in the discussion here. So we'll just bookmark that and uh, see, what, see where we go uh, maybe tomorrow on that. Okay, thanks, Dan. I actually think that we should hopefully get to that a little bit later today. Anyone else in the queue, Shreya? I do not see any further callers in the queue as of now. Okay, we do have a question in the chat, again, from Steve Kearns. Uh, to my question, earlier question for both balancing and feasibility tests, types of relies on existing market solutions to ensure that schedules are balanced and that delivery is feasible. What happens if the optimization fails to find a market solution? Could there be imbalance and or feasible delivery? Um, this may be similar to the answer. Yeah, Christina, I think that's 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 fairly similar on the on the infeasibility due to a lack of supply. The deliverability is, is something that I think we're gonna talk about in a little in a little bit too. That's a little bit of a different question on if the supply that is shown on a base schedule would actually be deliverable. Thank you. Please let me know if you have anything to follow up on that. Uh, anybody in the queue, Shreya? There are no callers in the queue as of now. Okay, no more chat questions. Okay, moving on to the next section, which would be potential design changes from the ISO's perspective. We put a lot of these out in the issue paper, and we wanted to talk about them here in this workshop and get stakeholder feedback on them. Can we go to the next slide, Christina? So the first real big topic would be what design changes would be necessary to the capacity test? And the biggest item here is should intertemporal constraints be applied to the capacity test? Again, our thought was always the capacity test served somewhat as a filter for the for its companion flex ramp test and that any un deliverable or unobtainable or stranded capacity that was shown in this test would most likely be picked up in that flex ramp test since that's actually looking at the initial reference points and where units are and where they can get to within that next hour. However, the August 2020 events did show that the current design can lead to entities incorrectly passing this test. So with those two bullets said, I do think adding intertemporal constraints is a really significant change that does have the potential to have a lot of unintended consequences that would affect how an EIM entity can participate in the EIM. It really makes the day ahead and hour ahead commitment decisions made by an EIM entity critical to passing the capacity portion of the test. And depending on the timeline of where we would, uh, the timeline that we're looking at for when that bid range would be available, it could actually create a kind of a perverse incentive structure regarding following optimal EIM dispatch. And I think that we can create examples if we wanted to that an EIM entity would be forced to choose between following an optimal dispatch that may involve decommitting a medium to long start resource or changing an MSG configuration and the ability to participate in a future hour of EIM simply because if those resources are offline, uh, depending upon what their fleet looks like, they may not have enough bid range capacity to be available in that following hour. So I think that the CAISO is 
open to considering intertemporal constraints and we want feedback from everybody, but I really would like to keep in mind that we consider that potential unintended consequences and how much more complicated this could make the capacity test. Uh, this all gets back to what is the objective, I think, of the capacity test. Are we trying to see if each EIM entity has enough capacity that on a standalone basis they would be able to meet their forecasted demand, or are we trying to look and see if they have enough capacity that they can meet their standalone demand in that upcoming hour, understanding that there are commitment decisions made in the previous hour by the larger body that may uh, impact their ability to meet that uh, expected demand. When we continue this line of thinking, I continue this line of thinking about if we're really looking for this test to see how much capacity is available to each EIM entity for that upcoming hour, I think the next logical place to look would be to potentially test for the, for the deliverability of the energy shown on a base schedule. Right now, deliverability is not tested for, and I think this is done because we, the CAISO, when we stood up the EIM, it didn't make sense to run a run an optimization and try to run the market to pass the RSC before we pass the market. But along the same line of thinking, if the stakeholder community thinks this is the intent of the capacity test, then I think that's something that should be considered. Can we go to the next slide, Christina? So the other thing I wanted to talk about on the capacity test is when we are concerned about intertemporal constraints. What I took away from the summer readiness initiative was most of the stakeholder community was concerned about intertemporal constraints and stranded capacity during really stressed system conditions rather than normal system conditions. I think this is a small snapshot. It's, five, it's 35 hours across five days, but it does represent the most stressed system conditions the KAISO has seen probably in the last decade. Uh, as evidenced by the fact that there was a firm load shed event on the 14th and 15th. And what this graph shows and what Guillermo presented in the May MSC meeting is that with the exception of a single resource that was starting up on the 14th, the Kaiser for the most part had all of its medium and long start capacity made available to the AM. There was not strategic withholding of medium and long start resources. Everything was made available. So. I think that we should keep this in mind that during stress system, system conditions, at least from the Kaiso perspective, that intertemporal constraints and stranded capacity due to units being offline, I'm not sure is that prevalent of a concern since all that capacity was made available with the exception of a resource starting up, which I think on the previous slide we have a sub bullet talking about potentially not including resources that are returning from outage that are not including them until at least their startup time would have been passed uh, within the bid range test. So I think there are potential compromises or ways we could imp implement intertemporal constraints that aren't as stark as is that capacity available in the next hour that might serve to reduce a little bit of the stranded capacity risk. But with this slide, I'm not sure how big of a risk this is during really stressed system conditions. So I think I'd like to pause there and see if any of the stakeholders or any of the EIM uh, joint entity participants on the call would have any comments. I see one caller in the queue. Caller, please go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Yeah, this is Stuart Kelly. Kelly. Um, you mentioned, or Guillermo uh, mentioned in the summer readiness that there was entities that passed the can, uh, capacity testing correctly. I guess the question really becomes, and you mentioned it previously, that the capacity test has been a, a filter. Did they ultimately um, fail the flex test? I suggest they probably, probably did. So I, I think adding these intertemporal constraints to the capacity test is probably not something we would want to do. Uh, it, it will most likely have unintended consequences. And, and further to that, you, you mentioned the forecast and demand, but no, nobody's really picked on, up on the accuracy of that forecast and demand. Certainly, LA is having quite some challenges with that forecasted demand. 
and, and that recent so-called improvement on, on, on CERN and load is actually add to our flex requirement, and we believe erroneously. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't think, um, you know, changing the capacity test in any way would, would, would benefit. As I said at the beginning, I think, um, you know, it, it's pretty much um, that you, you have to pass the capacity and flex, and if you're passing the flex, um, you should be good for the upcoming hour. I think more focus maybe should be placed on the timing of when these tests are run. I think that the timing and the initial uh, condition that's assumed for the test are probably the biggest flaws in the RAC tests at the moment. Thanks. Uh, Stuart, just to follow up, when you say the timing, are you are you referring to the final RSC right now being run at T40? Yeah, I think, I mean, if you look at back at the summer readiness, I mean, there's a bunch of IT system issues. Uh, they talked about the automators um, and some of the changes there and, and D-rates being a problem. But, but really, the test and getting to this T30 balancing is probably something we would want to see and then see the, the impact around testing and what that does and, and and also look at where the additional condition is derived from and fit us T67 and a half. I think it needs to be neither to the upcoming operating hour, more reflective of where the, the actual generation fleet is. I think I, I, I would be leery of making too many changes to the RSE until that T30 balancing test is actually implemented in production and look and see what performance is like after that change. Stuart, this is Don. I have a follow-up question. When you when you talk about timing, are you also concerned about locking the load and ver forecast at the T55, and then also then continuing to allow the initial condition to move? Is that the issue you're concerned about? Yeah, I, I just think everything's getting. Uh, it had to be for for different reasons. Run at at T40 the way the way the existing systems we are done when we introduced this. But this has always been a concern of everyone that um, that, that, that timing is too early for the upcoming operating hour, but you've got the challenge of the, you know, the first FM run at uh, T37 and a half or whatever. So I, I would like to see if the test be more uh, run near the operating hour, but I don't know how you um, do that and still um, you know, say that you run the FNN. It, it, it really becomes an RTD test at that point. So I am concerned about the timing. I still think it's too early. So I, so I think you've made a good point that that the earliness of the test is kind of a is is a tough nut to crack, given that your financial binding FMM run initializes you know 37 and a half minutes prior to the hour. But my question was around uh, fixing the load and the verb forecast at T55, but then continuing to allow the initial condition to move. And, and is that your concern, that that, that in essence, you're, in its, you're holding certain elements fixed, but those, the fact that those can change actually changes the initial condition that you're testing, that you use in the test? Yeah, that, 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 that's the other concern. Absolutely, Don. Do you have any other questions or anybody on the speaker line have any questions or comments as well? Uh, so this is Danny. I think that that is a good point with the upcoming T30 and using that RTPD6 initial condition in both the T40 and T30. I, I do think it's worth considering if the VER and load forecast should be locked a little later than T55 because right now we're reducing some of the moving targets at T55, and then we'll be reducing some of the other moving targets at T40. So I think we would like stakeholder input if there's a benefit to uh, locking those VER and load forecasts a little bit later uh, to give them a little bit. It's a trade-off between the accuracy of locking them later and only having a single curing period to address uh, all the changes. Danny, it's Jeff Spires with PowerX here. Um, I just wanted to make uh, a couple of comments and respond to uh, the presentation so far. Uh, you, you, you touched on a, a, a number of things, and uh, 
and some of the discussion is um, getting into some pretty detailed areas. So I, I just wanted to take a, a bit of a step back. I think there's a couple of things worth um, talking about um, before we sort of evaluate in particular what these enhancements should look like. You know, I think number one, just trying to uh, understand what are we what are we trying to accomplish? And I think fund, you, you mentioned it at the beginning of the presentation that fundamentally we're trying to measure whether a BA has sufficient capacity and flexibility to to meet its load. And I think you know we've added some some detail to that to say that that should be uh, on a standalone base standalone basis, but net of a diversity benefit. Um, and so the question is really, how do we get there? Because if we kind of just consider why are we having this discussion, we saw results from last summer that clearly were not consistent with the actual operating conditions at the time. And so it, it raised significant questions. And one of the points that's come up here today uh, a number of times is there's the flex test, there's the capacity test, are they the same? Are they different? Is one a filter for the other? And this is something that we talked about quite a bit at one of the previous workshops, I think in January, but it, it bears repeating that the, the measure of flexibility is, is different from a measure of capacity. And the fundamental structure of the flex test does not assess that question of whether or not a BA has sufficient capacity to meet their own load. And the reason I say that is the flex, of, the flex test is only measuring the change in demand from one hour to the next. And in addition, as we've just been kind of noting, it's starting from the current hours dispatch. And for that reason, EIM transfers that have already been determined in the current hour play a role in determining whether or not the BA can pass that test. And then of course the failure consequences of failing that test are, are to freeze transfers. This is like you mentioned before, a complicated test. It's not straightforward to interact with as a participant and it's not straightforward to even just conceptualizing the test and having a discussion about it is difficult because of its complexity. And that is why the EIM entities have really focused a lot of our time and discussion on the need for a straightforward capacity test that asks that basic question of, is there enough supply to meet load and is formulated in a way that is simple and transparent so that we can, first of all, um, interact with the test from day to day in a way that's um, more straightforward, but also so that we can all understand the meaning of the test and be confident in its, um, in its accuracy. Uh, so I, I, I think that from our point of view, the need to focus on a capacity test as an accurate and effective measure of meeting load is critical. I don't think that using it as kind of a filter and hoping that the flex test catches any uh, issues from any capacity shortfalls is the right approach. I think we are believing that the right thing to do is to assess the capacity set test on a standalone basis. It also gives us some flexibility in the future to contemplate whether the failure consequences should be different between a flex related failure and a capacity failure. But that aside, I think this, to start with, what we really need to be confident in is that we have a capacity test that is straightforward, we can understand it, and we, we think that it stands alone in terms of measuring appropriately whether or not the BA has enough resources. Um, the last thing I'll say is, and, and we have a, an element of our presentation that gets into this same issue, but I think nobody wants to see a failure as a result of, of following a dispatch. I, I, I agree with you that that's not at all what we're looking for. 
Um, and we have to find the appropriate balance to say, you know, where do you draw the line uh, between supply that is available in real time and should be included in the test versus supply that even if there was no EIM was not available for whatever reason, if it was on an outage or, or something else, it wasn't really there in real time and it shouldn't be included. Um, and so we can come back to that, but I just kind of wanted to back it up a level to really emphasize that we think that this, the need to find an accurate capacity test that we can, um, that we can all b believe in is, is, is something that's important and worth pursuing. You went on the speaker line, have any comments or questions? Also, if you're uh, on the participant line, you can press pound two to raise your hand. I see one caller in the queue. Oh, it looks okay. like they don't have a question. Um, I do not see the raised hand now. So this is Danny again. I, I do agree that we want an accurate test, but I would, I guess, pose the question to everybody on this call. What is the time frame that we want this capacity test to be accurate over? Are we measuring a BAA's standalone capacity to meet their demand forecast and uncertainty in the upcoming hour, or are we measuring that they would be able to do that and they could have chosen to do that should have they started and committed resources earlier. Like, it, it, there's just the whole question of this of how far out do we want to look and try to limit EIM participation based on previous commitment decisions made by EIM entities. Danny, it's Jeff again, and we will come back to this like I mentioned, but I, I think at this I mean, we're, we're talking about an hour ahead test related to a, a real-time market. And so I do think that, you know, fundamentally we are trying to evaluate whether or not the entity could meet their own load in real time without relying on the EIM. I think that's the question we're fundamentally trying to answer. Um, the other point is, of course, um, for, EIM entities, that includes the base scheduling activity that occurs each hour, and those base schedules are expected to be using resources that are capable of operating in the upcoming hour. So there's already a, you know, structurally, this is a real-time sufficiency evaluation performed ahead of each hour using resources that are generally expected to be there for that hour. But that being said, I think we do recognize that there are some, um, there are elements of the real-time market that are making uh, dispatch and commitment decisions ahead of that hour ahead process, and we don't want to inadvertently exclude supply that was legitimately available and may have been redeployed uh, by the market engine itself. And so for that reason, it seems logical to draw the line um, somewhere within the real-time, uh, the RTUC, you know, two-hour or so horizon to say, look, if, if the real-time dispatch has the ability to deploy or position a resource, that how that occurs shouldn't negatively impact the test, but the supply should have been available in real-time in the first place. And I think, you know, our discussions to date, um, I believe, are, are fairly consistent with some of the suggestions that the Department of Market Monitoring has made along similar lines. Um, so there may be some, some details there, but I think in our view, somewhere in that real-time horizon um, finds an appropriate balance between still adhering to the concept and the, the general objective of measuring each BA's ability to meet load in real time without relying on the EIM, but doing that in a way that doesn't cause you know, invalid failures or, or, as you mentioned before, lead to uh, the incentive to not want to 
respond to the real-time dispatch out of fear of, of having an impact negatively on the test. So that's kind of where we had landed so far on that concept. Thanks, Jeff. Just this kind of triggered a thought in my mind that I think the longest real-time lookout we have would be stuck, which is I think four and a half hours. So maybe that would be a, a good place to target and, and look what resources would be available in that median start horizon. And I guess assume that all entities who are participating in the AM would have correctly committed the, the long start resources that they have prior to that, that medium term horizon that we're looking at in stuck. Okay, do we have any questions on the queue? Yes, I do see one caller in the queue. Caller, please go ahead, your line is unmuted. Yes, Jeff, just, you're making reference to the August 2020. I don't know, Jeff, do you know that of any of the, identif uh, the entities that Guillermo identified as, you know, potentially would have failed the capacity test if you brought in the intertemporal constraints. Did any of those entities actually lean uh, on the EIN, or indeed, were those entities, um, did, did they ultimately fail the flex and the transfers were, were basically curtailed? I think that was that question was directed to me. I, I don't know that I can answer in any detail uh, a, a question like that about what the overall or what the you know specifics were from last year. Um, the, the fundamental issue from the August events was that, in particular, what we saw was mostly related to what was happening in the CAISO BA during um, the periods in which the CAISO was in emergency conditions while passing the resource efficiency test and or in some intervals there were some failures but the import transfers into the CAISO uh, were very large during that period and so that issue of um, seeing passes during emergency conditions in the CAISO BA as well as large imports into the CAISO during that period is what led to some of these fundamental questions. Um, you know, my, my, I can't speak clearly about what happened in other BAs at the time, but I think what we've determined is that the capacity test, as uh, Danny has pointed out, was not measuring because of some of these issues whether or not the CAISO had enough supply at the time, including during periods when there were load shed events, and that the flex test, because of its structure, doesn't catch that either. And because it is measuring a different need, it is measuring the change in demand from one hour to the next, it includes EIM transfers in terms of the initial starting point that that flexibility is being measured from, and all of these things led to the conclusion that there is a, a missing piece here, which is that simple and straightforward capacity metric that we don't see um, and, and we believe to be needed. Yeah, I just, I, I'm not familiar enough. I, I, I don't know if necessarily changing the capacity test gets to the majority of the issues that kind of saw. I thought, I thought it was more system-related, B-related there. Um, and I'm just concerned that we're, we're, we're changing these tests to, and, and it's not really necessarily fully the root cause of some of the, the problems in the case of BA. That's all I'm concerned about. I do not see any further. Uh, yeah, I do not see any further questions in the queue. Right. Yeah, I think the I think the point that uh, that was just made it is important though. Is there have been corrections made to the capacity test, which got rid of the the, in, the incorrectly applied D rates, and for the CAISO at least the double counting of some of the mirror resources. And 
when we went back and looked at last August, we saw failures of the capacity test during the majority of intervals we would have expected to see failures. So I don't think just looking at last August without considering the uh, corrections that have been made to the test is really a good look on how it would perform right now. And for additional information on this, I'd just point back to the presentation Guillermo made uh, in May to the MSC. Chris, do we have anybody in the queue? I do not see any questions in the queue as of now. I'm sorry, just now a uh, caller came in the queue. Okay. Caller, please go ahead. Your line is unmuted. This is Jason Shondra from Port and Journal. Uh, I'd like to get more clarity from Kaiso. Like what Kaiso just mentioned, that uh, uh, for last August, I'd like to see that uh, how many entities would have failed balancing tests. Uh, to me, right now, the difference between balancing and the capacity. Please correct me if I'm wrong. It's just the uncertainty component, right? And uh, I was wondering, has Kaiso ever considered just simply adding the uncertainty component into the balancing task so it would make the task more straightforward. So, so this is Danny. I think there is a difference between the two tests. The capacity test is looking at if there's enough capacity and the, the consequence for failing it is the inability to access additional EIM transfers. The balancing test is more of a financial test to incentivize base schedules to be submitted closer to forecasted demand. And again, for the additional information on the capacity test and how other EIM entities would have performed, this information is out there. And I, anybody who hasn't had a chance to look at it or hasn't looked at it recently, I would, I would encourage you to go look at it again, because I think this is a really good starting point for discussions and enhancements that might need to be made to the capacity test. Yeah, I guess the amazing part for me, it was just, uh, you know, how come an entity that passed the balancing test and also passed the flex test that failed the capacity test, right? So if an entity has been basically giving their resources within its speed range and uh, how possible that an entity passed the balancing test but failed the capacity test. So that's why so that, passing to my understanding, yeah, so sorry, go ahead. Failing the balancing test then results in the application of uh, potential over and under scheduling penalties if that failure is is significant enough in magnitude. So you could have uh, failure of the balancing test and not have financial penalties applied because the failure wasn't uh, large enough. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. But uh, um, and Danny, my point earlier was if the entity has been scheduling, base scheduling all the resources within its bay range that are offered to the market. And the entity passed the balancing test, but a failed capacity test. So that's why, per my understanding, to the comment that I made earlier was, I think that the big difference between two tests is the uncertainty component, which the uncertainty component isn't applied to the balancing test, but applied to the capacity test, right? Uh, correct, the uncertainty component is not applied to the balancing test. Yeah, then, you know, it's just out of curiosity. My, my earlier question is why not just simply add that uncertainty component to the balancing test so that EIM, EIM entities would see that I have my forecast load being 5,000 next hour and the uncertainty component will go to the balancing test, say 100 megawatt. So you just hold out 100 megawatt more in your balancing test. Would that be more straightforward? So I think we're well, talking is, a little bit. This is okay. Go on, Brad. This is this is Brad Cooper. Yeah, I, I think that's getting away from the intent of the balancing test. The the, the, the balancing test was originally put in. Uh, you know, we we modeled that after a feature the uh, Midwest ISO. Or the continent, whatever they're called, MISO, MISO has, and it, it was designed to prevent uh, gaming by strategically 
under or over scheduling, uh, and if you if you had differences in the LMPs uh, between your between your load and your generation, there's potential games uh, people could play uh, where they you know they either get dispatched up or dispatched down, and the imbalances would come to a net revenue. So it was intended to discover to discourage that. So throwing uncertainty into that would uh, you know get away from the purpose of it. Sure, it's similar to the capacity test in that it's looking at your at your uh, resources compared to your forecast, but it's its intent as a whole is a complete different function. Like Danny said, that a penalty is applied to it. You know, you pay whatever it is, 50% more of the LMP. It, it doesn't have anything to do with freezing transfers. And, you know, that, that, that would mean that if we combine them, that then you know, then rather than freezing transfers, we would somehow, uh, you know, apply this, this adder to the LMP if you failed the, the capacity test now combined with the balancing test. It just seems like it, it's, it's mixing up the purposes of the two. Yeah, thanks for a car for the CPS and Brad. Really appreciate that. Yeah, I was just. So I reminded the speakers to mute your line uh, if you're not speaking. Go ahead. You can finish your thought. Are you still there? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was okay. just wanted to say uh, thanks for the clarification, but I was just wanting to get more clarity on that one and also, uh, you know, trying to find out the, uh, the relationship in between balancing capacity and flex. Okay, moving on to the yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, next caller in the queue. Caller, please go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Hi, Dan from Customized Energy Solutions again. Just um, Zeishong's uh, comments there reminded me of something from my previous comment. That's that's just that it does seem like the Kaito is accounting for uncertainty, um, sort of in its uh, you know quote balancing test. If you were to think of of you know, the RUC process as, as a form of a balancing test for the CAISO, that just targeting a higher confidence interval than the standard day ahead market uh, forecast does seem like you're picking up sort of the level of uncertainty that may not be getting applied to the balancing test as it's applied to the other uh, EIM areas. Um, so it's just maybe a comment to consider if we're, when we look at that in the, in the future. Um, it, and the other thing that was brought up, um, was just kind of looking at more recent results as you know you said Danny and thinking about the uh the fixes that have been put into place earlier this year is um it'd be good to hear more about uh sort of how and why the guys have failed the uh bid range capacity test um last week just because it it seemed like even under our inning nineteen and twenty on the on the seventeenth that the Kaiso had plenty of supply. Uh, kind of based on where the market prices were that hour. And so it, uh, I'm just kind of curious if that was sort of a, a false positive failure during those times or kind of what has you know, been, you know, what's, what's um, uh, been discovered in kind of looking back at, at those failures at this point. Hey, this is, this is Brad. Dan, I'd just add uh, one comment. I, I wouldn't look at RUC as the equivalent of the balancing test. I'd, I, I think the, the better comparison is HASP, of, you know, because the balancing test had to do with uh, the base point for financial settlement, and, and RUC generation schedules are the base point for real-time settlement. I, I think the better analogy would be uh, the, the HASP schedules. And, and does that – does that half schedule timing then line up better with when the balancing test is applied to the EIM entity areas? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's much closer to the time the, the RSC is conducted. Okay. And Danny, did you have any thoughts on the 
just on the recent market performance question? I haven't had a chance. I, I don't know if we've done any root cause analysis and a deep dive on, on what happened last week yet. I I think we have Guillermo and Raul on the line, and they may know. I'm not sure with the timing if they've had a chance to look at this yet. Hi, Danny. This is Guillermo. Yes, yeah, that will be analysis to come. I think we provided as much as we could early this week. But obviously, there is still more effort to put in that to, to understand all the dynamics. And yes, you're uh, done right that we failed, I believe, three intervals on the 17th. And they were around the, the peak time. So we still just have to, to go to the full analysis to, to come back and report on that. Okay. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you, Dan. I don't. Yeah, please go ahead. Any other questions, Priya? I do not see any further questions in the queue as of now. All right, Danny, do you want to move on? Or yeah, yeah else sure, here? we can move on. And then it, it, I, I know in the joint DAM presentation Jeff's going to be giving later, we're going to be talking about these intertemporal constraints again. So if anybody has any uh, additional comments or thoughts or ideas on how this could be better applied, we can, or we'll have a second chance to chat about it in about an hour. So, yeah, I think we can move on. So the next idea for enhancements would be enhancements we could potentially make to the ramping sufficiency test. Uh, again, this test uses that uh, RTPD6 FMM schedule from the 15 minutes immediately prior to the next operating hour as its reference point. Since this is a market schedule, uh, it can include operator load forecast adjustment. Under very stressed system conditions, the power balance constraint can be relaxed. So this isn't necessarily a measure of the ability and flexibility to ramp from forecast demand. It's from a market schedule which has uh, other variables that are added to it. So one of our ideas was potentially adding a adding the power balance constraint relaxation quantity back into the flexibility requirement to at least be measuring from forecasted demand at that period of time to the next hour. Uh, but I would ask I guess from stakeholders, if if this is the right starting point that we should be measuring from, and then if not, what else could we use? This seems like a reasonable starting point because it's our most accurate prediction of what the conditions are going to be immediately prior to that upcoming hour. But we are open to ideas. Did you want to pause for questions or keep going? Yeah. No. No. I think we can pause for questions. Okay. So again, press down two if you want to ask your question verbally or send uh, the question in the chat. I do not see any questions in the queue as of now. Okay, thank you. I think we can move on then. On, on this topic, I think in our in our comments, we're going to be asking for comment on this. So if, if any ideas occur to anybody, please put them in your comments. Uh, the next slide would be the balancing test, which we've talked about a little bit previously. Uh, so again, it's not applied to the CAISO. We didn't think it needed to be applied to the CAISO because the, the same gaming opportunities that Brad detailed aren't really available to us since we don't base schedule However, there, however, we do from time to time, if the power balance constraint is relaxed, produce balanced schedules, but those balanced schedules are not balanced to forecast demand. They're balanced to uh, preset relaxation priorities. So I guess the question would be is should this test potentially be applied to the CAISO uh, just to ensure equitability? I would also note I did a quick check, and even during last August, that 5% threshold when the financial penalties would begin to be applied, it didn't look like during the worst intervals of last August we would have hit that threshold. But again, uh, we'd, we're looking for feedback on if this is something that should be potentially applied to the CAISO. I'd like to pause again for questions. Do we have anybody in the queue, Shreya? 
I do not see any callers in the queue as of now. Pause. Again, press pound two. Give it a moment. Danny, it's Jeff here. While we're waiting, I, I yeah. offer a comment on the last two slides. Um, both of these ideas uh, from the EIM entity group point of view, we haven't uh, spent a lot of time on either of these concepts. Um, but just speaking from my own perspective on these, you know, with respect to the first question around the flex test, I think it is touching on one of the issues that PowerX has commented on um, over time about the impact of measuring capacity, or excuse me, measuring the flexibility from the current hour after EIM transfers have already been included in that starting point. And that that in essence means that when there is an import from the EIM coming into a BA, they can use that import to back off their internal resources, creating more headroom that then is available to count towards meeting the uh, flex test for the following hour. And so there's a, an issue there where the objective of measuring whether there's enough flexibility of that BA's resources is difficult when you're starting from a point where you've already got EIM transfers coming in and those EIM transfers can increase the amount of flexibility that's showing. Um, that is a complicated issue and I think the balancing test one also is, but I, I would just say it seems like some of these complexities might be simplified again by starting and, and separating the capacity test and focusing on that first because one of the challenges that I think we see with the flex test in its current form is we're trying to use it to measure multiple different elements, whether it's flexibility, capacity, it's becoming this very convoluted catch-all and it can make, it just add to the complexity of trying to assess, does this test effectively measure each of these different things? So I, I feel as though there might be some good solutions here and I think we'll comment in writing when we get there. But before we do that, just to say, I think if we can, figure out the straightforward capacity test that we're comfortable with, um, it, it alleviates some of the onus on the other tests and might m reduce the number of changes that are needed in some of those other areas. Thanks, Jeff. All right, any questions in the queue or comments? Yes, I see one caller in the queue. Caller, please go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Yeah, Jeff, I, I guess we'll, we'll put a comment then, but I, I just, I, again, I'm concerned that we're, start, you know, we're putting a, a level of precision to a test that in, in many respects I still think is flawed if you look at that initial starting point. Uh, and and that, does, that does concern me. And, and, you know, it's almost, it almost feels as if we're chasing reliability when, when really, um, we, we should really just concentrate on that fundamental principle. You know, we're trying to stop entities from leaning and um, run tests at the appropriate time that demonstrates they're sufficient. Uh, and we have to recognize that, um, it, you know, doing that and it so far in advance is it, it, problematic. And um, I, I'm just concerned, as I say, we're just bringing a, a level of precision to something that, that is already somewhat flawed, but um, we'll, put, we'll put a comment then. Jeff, did you want to respond or did you have? Well, I don't, I don't think that I'm, I, I think what I am suggesting is consistent with that, which is right now we have very a very complicated series of tests that are challenging in many areas and lead to results that in my view do not seem to be accurate. And that includes recent periods, and I, I can talk about that later on during our presentation, but 
I think our focus to date has been on the capacity test for many of these reasons. Number one, it is the most basic sufficiency question you can ask. Fundamentally, do you have enough resources or not to meet load? It's a fairly straightforward question, and it deserves a test structure that is simple enough that we all understand the results and can be confident that they're accurate. Are there going to be, you know, of course it won't be 100% precise and we have to perform the test in advance and there are differences, et cetera, that between you know, the inputs to the test and then what actually happens within the hour, and I, I fully recognize that. But I think at this stage, we are sorely lacking in confidence that we have a set of tests that measures these characteristics accurately. And it, it, in, I, I think that the first step is to start with the simplest measure and having a test that is transparent and also straightforward so that we're comfortable with it. And uh, so I, I don't think that what I'm suggesting is, is different from the commenter's suggestion, and I, I, I hope that we're uh, able to find a path forward to resolution on some of this. Thank you, Jeff. I don't know if uh, Stuart's still in queue or if we have anybody else in the queue. There's a chat question, but I'll wait till we take the questions on the phone first. I do not see any callers in the queue as of now. So, Jeff, this is Danny. I would, like, following up on your previous comment, I would ask, I'm still trying to figure out what problem we're trying to solve on the capacity test. Are we trying to solve its accuracy all the time, being that it's implemented in every hourly interval, or are we trying to just make sure that it captures potential capacity shortages and really stressed system conditions? Because I think that depending upon what our objective is, like it leads to a really, really different test. Can you elaborate on I mean, I understand that stress system conditions are are infrequent, but I, I don't know if I'm understanding the distinction you're making between focusing on that versus something different. Well, well I think I think adding intertemporal constraints to the capacity test makes it really complicated. I think trying to account for resources that were decommitted or their their state was changed via optimal dispatch and account for startup times. I, like, I, I think the capacity test has the potential to become as complicated, if not more complicated, than the existing flexible ramping test. So it, are we doing this to try to make sure that during the really stressed system conditions, there's people have enough capacity to meet their expected demand and uncertainty during those conditions? Because if we're not, then we're going to make a really complicated test that all of the EIM entities are going to be dealing with in potentially trying to pass during all of the other hours that the test is run, which is, which is the majority of the hours. I, I think what we, I mean, I, I think ultimately this is a test that we perform every hour of the year. Uh, and the objective should be for it to be accurate to the greatest extent possible across that entire time frame. But some of the suggestions we have are not intended to make the test complicated. I think the concept is actually quite simple. And I think most people, if you were to have a conversation to say, you know, our objective is to evaluate the resources that you have available and measure where, whether or not you have enough capacity to meet your own load without relying on the EIM transfers to do that, they can understand that. That's a pretty basic question. And I think that the, some of the discussion we're going to have on Monday revolves around transparency so that we can more clearly see that that's occurring. But fundamentally, I think we're, we're looking for something simple. Now, I understand that there are you know, some considerations around how do you implement that concept and, and get it right? And, and that requires working into the details. But I think fundamentally we are looking to uh, measure something simple. And in terms of the accuracy, I mean, I, I just, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that before we saw what happened last summer, 
we already had questions about the accuracy of this test, but after we saw those events, I mean, it came to light that the, the inaccuracies weren't, you know, 100 megawatts here or there. They were multiple thousands of megawatts. And so, you know, we're really trying to get to a place where we all have confidence as a group that this is measuring sufficiency in an equitable way and that it's creating a level playing field. We're all comfortable with it. Like I mentioned before, I understand it won't be precise in every hour, but let's see if we can define some straightforward rules that we think find the right balance for what gets included and then, you know, bolster that with ongoing transparency so that we can see how it works going forward and make adjustments as needed. Thanks, Jeff. I, I agree that that's what we are looking for out of the capacity test too. And just from where I'm sitting, it seems like getting there could be complicated. So I guess I'm looking forward to, to your presentation later and then the comments that we receive from stakeholders to see if we have any ideas that get us to that place where it's more accurate and people have more confidence in the test without it becoming overly complicated and burdensome and hard to pass for entities in all operating hours. We I have see a caller in the queue. Yes, I see a caller in the queue. Caller, please go ahead. A line is unmuted. I start from uh, LA. Uh, I think, I guess there's a couple of points. I think first on the transfers, I think there's some issues with excluding the transfers, right? Because, you know, the stuff has already made some commitment decisions that uh, plays into where those resources are and what transitions they've done, et cetera, et cetera. And um, by, uh, by excluding the transfers in the test, I think that becomes problematic because of what the stock's done to your resource. That's one. And then, Two, I think, on the capacity test, we really are trying to refine a capacity test for, for to deal with stress system conditions. That's, that's basically what I'm saying. I mean, it's, it's tantamount to become a reliability test. And if you even consider the flex test, it's not meant to deal with, um, if you look at the histogram, it's not meant to deal with every um, eventuality. So um, there, there's certain, you know, it's like 99% of whatever, um, of instances, and then it's on the BA for that remaining component. So I think there's a danger, as I say, of re refining the test um, to deal with just, just to ultimately deals with that stress system condition again uh, that, that occurred in o uh, August. Uh, and I don't know if that's where we, we want to go uh, with that test. All right, Shreya, do we have anybody else in the queue? Yes, I do see one more caller in the queue. Caller, please go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Hi, this is um, Kathleen Colbert from Vistra. Can you hear me, Danny? Yes. Hi, Kathleen. Hi, how's it going? Um, I really appreciate all the, dis uh, the, the dialogue going on today. I'm um, looking forward to both of these days of, of of these meetings. Um, I wanted to pose a question, and, and it may be more for the other um, EIM speakers that have been talking, Stuart and Jeff, but I I hear kind of this repeated reference to, well, either the capacity test is needs to be very simple and easily understood, which I have to be honest, I, at least, I mean, at least relative to the other tests, I consider it one of the more simple test that is applied. The other thing I hear is a reference to we want to have confidence in it, um, but I, and I may be missing it, but I didn't really, I'm not catching what it is about the test, the capacity test in its current form that they find that, that there is, that there's some group, I'm not using they very loosely, it seems like there is a group that find it's too complicated and or they don't trust its output. And I think for me, kind of sizing, trying to size the issue, like what's the issue being raised? Um, I think the way you framed it, it made the most sense to me. Um, so, but is that the common issue of, are we trying to kind of see if there's tweaks that are needed to capture 
stress days. It's kind of what I thought we would be talking about, but it's now sounding very general. So this is a long winded question of, I'm getting maybe more confused than I was when we started this meeting, kind of based on some of the general language I'm hearing. And I was wondering if they could pin down something very specific that they don't have faith in in the test. Thanks, Kathleen. This is Jeff Spires. Uh, I'll, I'll try to answer that. Um, I think you're right, though, that some of the comments I've made about the accuracy and the confidence are general because the, the, the concerns that we've had have stemmed from the results. And so one of the, of the tests, so one of the things that we will talk about on Monday that's an issue is that the transparency of how the test is calculated, what the inputs and outputs are, has been limited in the past. And so one of the things we're looking for is more clarity and reporting around what is the test actually measuring, what are some of those inputs and outputs. Last summer, we clearly saw results that just didn't uh, stand up to, or didn't align with common sense, which was emergency conditions, load shedding events, yet passing a sufficiency test. And I think that is a general concern because you don't need to really know the specifics. The bottom line is that result isn't consistent with what the expectations would be when your objective is to be measuring sufficiency. So part of the issue is that we don't necessarily have all of the information at our fingertips to be able to pinpoint it's this issue or it's that issue or it's several, et cetera. We are using what we can see and looking at the overall outcomes and raising general concerns with whether or not those overall con uh, outcomes are consistent with what we would expect to see from an accurate test. So, so that's kind of one issue. Now, that being said, I do really want to emphasize, we greatly appreciate all of the CAISO's work in the last few months, the, the transparency and the reporting and analysis that Guillermo and others at the CAISO have worked on, including the, um, the presentation at the MSC, were extremely helpful, and those are really what helped us as an EIM group more clearly understand what are some of the issues that we think are contributing to some of these challenges, and um, those are going to be, you know, those informed a lot of the suggestions we're going to present later today. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I think we're ultimately hoping for, like I mentioned before, is more reporting and analysis along the lines of some of what um, CAISO put together at the MSC earlier, I think last month. That kind of analysis on a more ongoing basis would be fantastic because really before we saw some of that, we were uh, having to basically guess on what some of the issues might be. Um, so I, I'm hoping that answers the question. I mean, in terms of the, the other thing I would note is we recognize the CAISO has made several enhancements, including correcting two uh, significant errors that played a, a role in the outcomes last year, and, and we appreciate those changes. But part of the general concern is that even with those fixes, we, there are still resource sufficiency results even in recent days during the, the heat last week that are difficult to understand and I, at least from my point of view, raise, continue to raise questions around whether or not this test is playing the role that we think it should be. Um, and uh, it, it's a function of what we see as being conditions and uh, on different days, as well as what the RS results are showing and what the failure consequences are during those periods that I think we need to be thinking about. So I'm, I'm hoping I'm answering your question, but part of the lack of specifics are a result of that. 
Um, no, that's really helpful. I, I appreciate that. I request you to please uh, mute your phones in case you're not talking to avoid any background noise. Thank you. I do not see any so further just, callers in the queue as of now. Oh, thank you. Yeah, if I just want to follow up on that last point. You said some of the recent results haven't made sense. Is this, you think that the test was failed incorrectly, it was passed incorrectly? Do you think these results are more related to how the KISO performed or how other EIM entities performed? In, in the RS test? Yeah, that's a good question, uh, Danny. I mean, I, I think there was, uh, during the, the heat last week, you know, a good example is on the afternoon of the 17th, the hottest day, that was the day that um, the KISO earlier in the day had issued a warning anticipating potential emergency conditions in the KISO BA during the net peak hours later in the afternoon. And the results in the EIM show that even during those tight hours when KISO was anticipating the potential for entering into an emergency, we are seeing some intervals of passing and some intervals of failing. And the additional piece of information that's related to that is that's going on during those hours, the EIM imports into the KISO BA, including in those intervals when there were failures, reached as high as 3,900 megawatts in the, uh, in the FMM. So import deliveries of close to 4,000 megawatts, even during hours when there are sufficiency failures and expectations of emergency conditions. That, you know, th those types of facts just seem similar to some of the uh, conditions we saw last year or some of the concerns we had around, is this test uh, properly measuring sufficiency or not? Uh, the, the other thing, you know, you asked about other BAs, I, I think one of the challenges is we actually, we have to be able to contrast that to what happens elsewhere in the EIM area. And the data that we see looks as though there was at least one other EIM entity um, up in the Northwest that failed during the same hours on the same day. And it looks as though that BA had their EIM imports limited at close to zero. So, practical effect and the, and the outcome appears to be that what you're, you're ending up with is a sufficiency design that has the potential to cause some entities to face consequences that effectively shut them off from importing from the EIM altogether, but at the same time other entities continue to receive potentially multiple thousands of megawatts even in the hours when they're failing and, and faced with um, close to emergency conditions. And so I can't speak to the specifics because we don't have yet that clear transparency about what's going on, but I think it does raise ongoing significant questions that are hard to answer around, is the test accurate? Is it being applied in a way that's consistent and, and is it, I guess fundamentally, is it performing the intended function that we think it should be? Um, so I think all of these things are indicators that we have more work to do here to try to make improvements and, um, and, and work towards improving the accuracy and, and the transparency so that we can get to a place where we understand the answers to those questions and we feel confident about the results, and, uh, and that's why I think we're here talking about these issues. Thanks, Jeff. I'd, I'd like to follow up on that a little bit. I think the, the example of the KISO receiving EAM transfers and a Pacific Northwest entity not receiving EAM transfers and then both failing the test is, those transfers are the result of economics prior to the failure of the test. I'm not. I'm not sure the test design is intended to make sure people have equal access to transfers after they fail the test. 
that was just where the system was when entities failed the test. Yeah, well, I'm not sure that if, if the objective is that every BA is resource sufficient, you know, ahead of the hour, and the concept is that we have a sufficiency evaluation that is supposed to protect against um, leaning on the EIM, is it appropriate to have an outcome that's that different where one entity that doesn't meet that criteria has the ability to bring in megawatts approaching 4,000 and another has no ability to bring in megawatts at all. So I think there is a, an equity question there and part of that is of course driven by the failure consequences in that discussion. But that is the type of outcome that I think gives pause to whether or not this test is functioning the way we think it should be. Tris, do we have anybody in the queue? I do not see any callers in the queue as of now. Anybody else on that speaker line has comments? Tris, it looks like my uh, computer's frozen, so I may have to have you, oh, never mind, it's back. Oh, sure. Yeah, this is Danny. I'm just, I'm kind of thinking through that last comment. And, I, and I'm not sure that we ever intended the RSC to penalize previous economic activity and, and try to regulate that via a real-time test at a, in a different time frame. So I think we'd, or I at least want to kind of think through more of what you said, but I'm not sure that that is the design of the test. And to the extent that I guess the stakeholder community thinks that should be the design of the test. We'd like feedback on that. Anyone in the queue, Shreya? I do not see any callers in the queue as of now. So Danny, we did have that uh, question, the questions from Steve Kern. Yeah, asking if they're I think that, I'm sorry, Christina, go on. Oh, just asking if there are downsides to applying the balancing test to KISO, and would implementation be straightforward or complex? Well, I think the downside would be that KISO doesn't have the same incentives to uh, submit imbalanced schedules as the that is inherent to the base scheduling process. So that would be the downside that the equitability of all entities are, same to this, are exposed to the same financial penalties, I guess would be the benefit. Uh, implementation would probably be somewhere in between. For EIM, we're settling imbalance energy and if that LMP penalties are being applied to that imbalance energy settlement. I think for the KISO, the entire market is being settled multiple times and so it would be a little bit more complex finding the reference point where we would want to settle the KISO from. Danny, this is James. Hey, James. The, the overscheduling and underscheduling penalty is already set up that if we do have a failure or we determine there's a failure in the ISO, that we will schedule, uh, we will assess an overscheduling and underscheduling penalty. We will do it where we will look at the entire ISO BAA, see if we are within that 5 or 10 percent, and then the penalty pricing would apply to each lap uh, and then allocated to the measured demand in the ISO. Oh, okay. So what I'm understanding you're saying is that this that the, res the results of the failure of the balancing test is already applied to the KISO. Yeah, when we did the original design, we did the design with the understanding that in the future that this might eventually apply to the ISO. 
So we already incorporated the ISO in our settlement design. Well, great. I think then that, that answers Steve's question that the, the implementation would be feasible. And let me know if you have any follow-up questions, Steve. I know uh, you had asked this a while ago, so hopefully you're still on the line. And I apologize. I've been cutting in and out throughout the call, so I apologize if I missed the earlier question. That's okay, Jay. Do we have anybody in the queue, Shreya? I do not see any callers in the queue. Okay. And Steve doesn't have any follow-up questions. So. Would you like to move on, Danny, or anybody else have a comment on yeah. the line? Okay. Oh, we can go ahead and move on. I have, I have one last slide. So this last slide focuses on how we might want to try to incorporate either KAISU or EIM operator actions that would free up capacity that could be utilized by the EIM. How would that be? potentially included in the resource efficiency evaluation. And what I would mean by this is uh, should a BAA utilize load as non-spending reserve to free up that withheld capacity, should that, should that energy be available to be shown in the RSC? And the same thing would apply to accessing uh, emergency demand response programs. So I think the first question that I'd like feedback on and was hoping to have discussion on is, is should these types of actions be applied to the RSC and be able, be able to be shown as capacity? And then second, if we do think that they should, how should we go about doing that? Right now there's a bit of a lag in the timing of these. For, for the ISO, should a DR program be activated and, and the, say, for example, RDR and the bids enabled at 38 minutes prior to the operating hour, their impact and the additional capacity they free up wouldn't be able to be reflected in access to additional incremental EIM transfers until the first interval of the following hour, which is which would be 98 minutes. So there's a lag on how quickly these things can be accessed, and is that lag appropriate? If BAAs have documented procedures and plans in place to take these uh, operator-driven steps to free up additional capacity to participate in the EIM. So I'd like to open that up for comments. Danny, this is Gary Nolan. Uh, may I weigh in there real quick? Yeah, sure. So I just wanted to clarify because um, if load truly is interruptible load, which I'm assuming that's not what we're talking about here because interruptible load already does count for non-spinning reserves and it's already part of your reserves. So I'm assuming you're, we're talking about utilizing firm load. Is that, I wanted to clarify that first. Yeah, I think that's what we're referencing. Okay, so my understanding from the NERC standards is that in order to be able to utilize firm load as non-spinning reserves, you have to be declared to be in an EEA. So you would have to already be declared to be essentially experiencing resource and reserve deficiencies uh, to be able to then turn around and count load as your uh, reserves. And so fundamentally, I, I believe, I know ourselves and, and a number of others have voiced that we would not believe those two are, are agreeable. You can't be in an EEA, and then by getting into an EEA, that allows you the opportunity to declare load as reserves, and then now say I want to count that reserve as part of my resource efficiency. So I, I would state that first. Okay, thanks, Gary, for that, for that perspective. You're welcome. Trius, do we have anybody in the queue? I do not see any callers in the queue as of now. Any other comments from the speakers? Yeah, I guess I'm thinking through that comment that Gary just had, and it does kind of bleed into specifying how entities uh, use their AS and what they use for AS, which the EIM intentionally doesn't do because that, that's a – BAA reliability function that each each BAA is responsible for. So I do understand that like the high level conflict of being in the EEA and accessing additional EIM 
transfers being potentially in conflict, but at the same time, this really gets into having rules about what entities would be able to use for their AS. Well, if I understand correctly, you're you're wanting to use your you're wanting to use your load as your reserves. Is that correct? I think that's what this concept would put forward, yeah. Right. So the, again, then the, the qualifier is then you're in an EEA. Yep. So it's um, you, you can use your reserve your load as reserves when you're in EEA, but then it kind of questions the how are you then resource efficient? Yeah, I I, I understand the the conflict. What about the idea of uh, armed load potentially being used as ABC? Do you see that same conflict in that? As being used as what, I'm sorry? Available balancing capacity kind of set aside by each BAA. Firm load. Yeah. Well, I guess in that question, the once once all our load is uh, curtailable, then then, then what, what, what are we, what is the point of a test at that point, I guess would be my kind of question, right? Once you're allowed to essentially say all of my load is curtailable to pass the test, if I say it. No, I think, this is Don, I, I think, uh, I think in listening to your argument, I think you're arguing that if you arm load, it's sort of equivalent to the process that EIM entities have, the Kaisa doesn't have this, this process, which is available balancing capacity where they, they can identify additional capacity that's there to meet solely their reliability needs. Um, and so to the extent that, that you have, for instance, a power balance violation in your balancing authority area, the, the market can access that available balancing capacity, but that available balancing capacity also can't support incremental transfers out of your balancing authority area. So I think when I was listening to your argument, you're sort of arguing that well, arming load it really shouldn't shouldn't is, is more like available balancing capacity. And if that was the case, then the KISO might want to put in rules that when it arms load, that it doesn't allow additional transfers out during those periods um, that it's armed load. Just like but the two deployed. It would continue to allow transfers in. Correct. Just like ADC. Yeah. Right, so I think that's what we're saying. You're, the point of the of the test is whether or not you are showing up sufficient. But remember, the ABC fact is that ABC doesn't count towards your test. And I know that some EIM entities in the past have advocated that it should count towards their flex and capacity test. So I'm sorry, what does not count as part of the test? If available balancing capacity for an EIM entity, that doesn't that doesn't count towards passing the resource efficiency test, and some in the past have yeah. argued that it should, and we've argued it shouldn't. Um, yeah, no, I, I think I guess what I'm I'm trying to say is that fundamentally, myself anyway, and, and perhaps others would would think that the test would say that if you're if you're not if you have to arm load, firm load, which means you're in an EEA. Then there should be some consideration that 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 does not mean you're sufficient. I, I don't disagree that perhaps it doesn't currently, but I I would fundamentally say that those two things are not uh, are not agreeable. All right. Do we have any questions in the queue? At this time, we have no callers in the queue. Hey, Luke. Anyone on the speaker line have any comments? No, Christina, I think that the ISO's uh, portion of potential enhancements uh, is completed, so we can turn it over to Jeff uh, for the joint EIM entity ideas for how we might want to try to enhance the test. Great. Uh, thanks, Danny. And I think some of the, the topics that we've included in our presentation were, uh, were already covered, uh, at least partly. So 
we can we can discuss them again. I'll I'll try not to go you know, to dwell too much on those topics if we've already sort of tackled them. Um, so I am going to be getting into some of the areas that the EIM entities have discussed around potential enhancements that we think should be uh, evaluated. I think there are obviously details that we need to discuss, and so some of these are really uh, asking questions or, or proposing things that we would like to hear from the CAISO and hear from others about. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, I think you know ultimately what we're really striving for is 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 trying to uh, get to a place where we all agree that we have a test that's being applied in a way that is um, sufficiently accurate and that it's consistent, et cetera. And um, we have talked about what we think the sort of immediate short-term steps are for that. And we think that the, the, the most appropriate next steps are, one, to look at the specific enhancements that I'm about to talk about. And number two is really to focus our time on improvements to the transparency and oversight of the test. And that's something that uh, Mark Simons from Bonneville Power Administration will be presenting on on Monday. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned before, I just want to emphasize that we really appreciated all of the effort that the CAISO put forward um, in terms of the additional analysis of last year. And we really think that using some of that analysis to help inform what kind of transparency uh, we could use going forward is something that would be a significant improvement. So there's more discussion to be had about that on Monday. And, you know, the last point is we do look forward to discussion on failure consequences, um, especially, you know, in light of the, the example I gave last week where um, the, the freezing approach that's currently applicable can lead to very different outcomes depending on a BA that tends to be an importer versus one that doesn't. Um, but that being said, that is a complicated discussion to have if we're not on a path towards a test that we're comfortable with the accuracy of and the, with the transparency. So in terms of priority, we do think that focusing on, the, on those first two topics is, is where we should start. Um, so why don't I just jump in here. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. This is really um, repeating some of what we already discussed earlier this morning. And I think fundamentally the, the, the statement that I would start with is this is a real-time sufficiency test. And conceptually, at the highest level, the capacity that's being counted should be capable of performing in real time. That's just the general principle. And in the issue paper, uh, Kaiso put forward this chart on the left that shows the quantity of capacity that, for various reasons, would not have been available during these hours. And uh, uh, Danny showed a, a different chart that generally shows the same information uh, earlier this morning. And this analysis really helps to illustrate the potential to have uh, materially overstated capacity being included in the mid-range capacity test. Um, on this particular day, as you can see, it was anywhere between 1,000 up to, it appears to be as much as 3,000 megawatts. Now, I do want to just emphasize, I understand that the magnitude of the, these issues on this particular day uh, is larger than other days based on their, the fact that there was uh, a long start resource that was attempting to come back from an outage 
and it was a larger resource that um, had a very uh, significant role in these numbers. But I do think that this illustrates that if the goal is to measure available capacity in real time and there are no controls on that at all, then the potential exists for significant um, inaccuracy. So it may not be that this occurs all the time, but it's really almost, we don't really have any way to say whether or not it's likely to occur on any particular day if there's no um, criteria set forward that says, okay, we're going to first verify that the, the resource is legitimately available in real time in some fashion. Uh, so moving to the next slide, please. So we, we have had discussion about this already this morning, but essentially the mid-range capacity test, the high-level objective or the principle is whether or not the test is appropriately measuring each entity's sufficiency in real time as measured by its ability to meet load without relying on EIM transfers. That's kind of the high-level goal of the test in the first place. And so one general concept we thought of would be to try to find a simple and straightforward way to, to both include supply that's legitimately available but also exclude supply that isn't. We started with a general rule of thumb to say, well, the, the capacity that's being included should generally reflect the achievable output within the real-time horizon. So we're not as specifically concerned about how it gets dispatched by the market, and we don't want to penalize someone for following their dispatch. That's not at all the objective. But the supply should be at least realistically available and capable of producing output within that real-time horizon. And we think that that's, that general rule is really important because we need to, first of all, exclude supply that isn't available in order to do, to meet the objective we have of accurately uh, measuring each BA's ability to meet its own obligations. And we also want to try to find some consistency. Um, it is an hour ahead test. As I mentioned earlier this morning, EIM entities uh, submit base schedules each hour and the expectation is that those are using resources that are capable of operating at that level in the forward hour, in the future hour. And, you know, we really want to find something though that is consistent with efficient market dispatches in real time. And I think that's to, to Danny's comments earlier, we want to find the right balance so that we're, we're getting this test right. Uh, next slide, please. So here was one. Uh, Jeff. Sorry. Hey, Jeff, Jeff, can we have. This is, Conrad. This is Brad. I, I, I'm wondering why you're defining the real time market horizon as um, two hours when um, you know, the short term unit commitment process is going up four hours. Well, I'm referring to the, uh, the RTUC. which is actually sure, on the next what, slide. Yeah, but why aren't we considering the, the stuck also? Because we're trying to find the appropriate, I think part of the issue is that five hours out, how, what resources, by the time, you, let me put it another way, by the time we are performing this evaluation, we are trying to measure whether or not there is a sufficient supply to, to meet load in the next hour, but we recognize that the market optimization is already running. We're performing this test 40 minutes out. The dispatches have already been occurring within that FMM window, and so we're trying to accommodate that, recognize that, say, well, we don't want to disqualify something because it happened to get dispatched uh, to a lower level, for example. But if it takes five hours to start or it's 
was not turned on in the applicable time beyond that, it doesn't seem reasonable to say that it would have been available to meet load um, without the EIM. Now, maybe that's, I, I don't want to be too definitive about that point because this is really just at this time a concept where we are trying to determine where is that right line to draw. And that's why we, you can see on the chart here, we were thinking that, well, you know, that real-time dispatch when you actually have the, the market committing and decommitting the shorter-term resources, then in those cases, whether it's online or not, it would be included in the test. But leading up to that window for the medium to long start resources, those the expectation would be that they would be online because otherwise it's just not practical to assume that they'd be available. Um, so that was kind of the thinking, but uh, you know, I'm certainly interested to hear your feedback on that. Yeah, Jeff, this is Daniel. I think the way at least trying to interpret what Brad was saying is, I guess our idea would be if those resources are made available in that medium start horizon and the dispatch doesn't think that they're needed, the advisory dispatch should, should those EIM entities potentially be punished for not starting those up regardless, uh, should they actually be needed at a later interval with yeah. our thought? Yeah, for, for example, what if it's economic to, uh, dispatch um, transfers and uh, decommit the resource. You know, the, the, the resource is there and offered, but economics got it decommitted. Seems, it seems like we, would be, we, we could be setting up, uh, you know, setting up incentives to uh, uh, alter bid costs or, or not off or uh, self-schedule resources rather than let neck, neck the real economics play out. Well, I guess the question I would ask about that is, I mean, that in, from an EIM point of view, EIM entity point of view, they need to submit base schedules each hour. So I don't think, is that even possible today, the, the example you gave, Brad? I mean, if, if an EIM entity decided not to commit enough resources to meet its own load, and instead rely on the EIM, it wouldn't have a set of base schedules entering the hour, would it, that are, that are balanced? Maybe I'm misunderstanding that, but. I think, Jeff, it might be more of a timing thing, that the resources could be made available in that longer horizon, but, but due to the forecast, they might not be thought to be needed and, and they might not be committed, even though they would have been available if they would have been needed and the forecast was higher. But then when you get to that, that more real-time operating horizon, say the forecast is slightly higher, and then those resources weren't turned online when they could have been turned online, then an entity could potentially fail the test due to that reason. But that, okay, but that's different, that's different from displacing a resource from the EIM, I think what you just described. Well, I think it's, I think it's both. I think this was, this really gets into the EIM and any decisions made by it or, or startups or not startups, how do you account for those in that, for those that were previously made uh, in the real-time operating horizon. I think, if we can go back to the last slide, Christina. I think this does bring up kind of the bigger question I would have and maybe want to push back a little bit on this principle is the idea that uh, we should be testing with excluding EIM transfers. I mean, those EIM transfers are the reason why entity systems are positioned the way they are. Uh, to pass this with excluding EIM transfers, that kind of, that potentially reduces some of the benefit of participating in the AIM. It could lead to a lot of resources based schedule that came in just to provide potential capacity in future intervals if we wouldn't, or to not account for those transfers. So it's, and I'm trying to think through this and it's really hard to separate the two. 
Well, let's keep in mind we're talking about capacity, not energy. And if you can't meet your own load without relying on an EIM import, I, I, I don't think that that is a measure of sufficiency. But, it, but I in a previous under interval, if you, if you chose not to commit a resource because the EIM didn't think it was needed because you're, you're, you could have met your, met your uh, demand with your resources and EIM transfers, then in a future interval, should that decision preclude you from participating in the EIM? Right, and I think that's, I, I think you're, you're tackling a, a subject that uh, the MSC has raised too, where we want to make sure we don't get too focused on the dispatch of the resources or the, the, the commitment decisions, and that we make sure we're appropriately measuring whether or not that capacity exists in the first place, and I think that's kind of um, the trade-off or the, the, the balance we have to find. So I, I do understand what you're raising, and I think it's a legitimate discussion, and there's probably opportunities to refine this thinking um, to consider, you know, do we go beyond that two-hour window to the short-term unit commitment? And I, I don't want to um, say one way or the other whether that's the right solution or not. I mean, we, we as an EIM entity group have really been focused on how do you assess each entity's ability to meet its own load. Um, and I think for most EIM entities, because of that need to submit hourly base schedules, that naturally leads to counting on resources that are actually available in real time, meaning generally speaking for the most part the next hour. And we recognize that we may need to go beyond that to, to capture some of these uh, previous commitment decisions, either through the real-time or short-term unit commitment timeline. So I think that's a good, uh, I think your feedback is, is helpful and we should continue to think that through. Um, but that being said, I don't think, you know, ultimately we're really even deviating in principle from, from this concept of saying, what we're really trying to do is, is measure that capacity in real-time it seems like really the question is what define what real time means and where do you sort of draw that line. So I think that that is good feedback. But if any other EIM entities that, that have these types of resources and are thinking about commitment decisions on an hourly basis have um, additional perspectives, I think it would be good to hear from them. So if you want to enter the Q press count too. Anybody wants to make a comment or ask a question? And Sharia, let me know if anybody raised their hand, please. Sure. I do not see any callers in the queue as of now. Thank you. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, Let's just keep moving to the, to the next one, please. This was just a chart where we were trying to uh, more precisely define what would be the criteria for a number of different scenarios. I don't think that this has a lot of additional information probably beyond the discussion we've already had other than, you know, I think one area that the August 14th event identified was this issue with offline resources returning from an outage. And I guess the, the question is, it, it doesn't seem, it seems as though there were two fundamental issues with that. One is um, the resource returning from outage was not uh, a, was not going to be able to reach its maximum output. I think it may have been 800 megawatts or something like that. And so there really wasn't uh, any realistic ability to get there in a reasonable amount of time. So question number one is should a resource that's coming back from an outage be limited to some lesser amount 
um, just to reflect the fact that it's, it's having to slowly ramp up coming out of that outage. And then the other issue was it, it seemed as though it got included in the test for multiple hours in a row when it wasn't able to return. So the question is, is there a way to try to address that so we don't have something that's not, um, not able to return to service get included hour after hour? So those are just two questions I think that we need to contemplate to try to see if there's a solution to that. Hey Jeff, this is, this is Brad. Uh, back to what we were talking about a second ago, your, your point that the, the, you have to submit base schedules hourly. Is it your point that, because you don't need to, you can meet the capacity test with um, not just base schedules, but with bids, but your, is your point that the balancing test makes you have base schedules up to the forecast? So, so you can't you can't count um, uncommitted resources in the balancing test. I wasn't thinking of the balancing test in particular. I was just thinking of the the scheduling overall, where each hour you're you're putting together a a schedule for your resources that generally balances against load. So I guess yes. I, I didn't. I wasn't thinking of it precisely in the context of the balancing test, but just saying the nature of submitting hourly base schedules each hour generally means that you're using resources that are online and available to you for that hour. Okay. So. Okay, well, why don't we move on? Uh, there's a few other topics here that I, I want to make sure we don't run out of time. Uh, okay, um, imports. This was a discussion that uh, occurred also with uh, Guillermo at the MSC meeting about intertie delivery failures. Um, you can see on the chart the quantity of import supply that was being included in the capacity test was the blue lines and then the actual deliveries in real time are um, probably best, it's probably easiest to see the green line. And this is, is an issue where there is a difference between what the CAISO includes in the resource efficiency evaluation and the approach that the EIM entities use. Um, EIM entities include their interchange based on schedules, um, generally speaking, e-tags. And by doing that, it means that when a, when a schedule is included in the test, that BA knows the source of that supply and which BA it's coming from. That's different from the CAISO. The CAISO at the binding test at T40 includes all import schedules that are cleared through the HASP. And the challenge with that is that it, it can conclude speculative bids that may have been submitted by an entity that offered, say, supply at a high price, hoping that if they clear the market, then they'll go out and buy it. So in other words, someone's just submitted a bid, they don't have supply arranged to support that delivery. And the challenge is that in the critical hours, when it's tightest, there is a high risk that that entity may not be able to find supply and they end up not showing up. And what that can mean is that we end up with a risk of delivery failures that aren't random, they are actually concentrated and the risk is elevated in those critical tight supply conditions that we're most interested in. Um, and so this seems like a fairly uh, straightforward proposal and solution, which is that to avoid this situation, and we see uh, examples of it in this chart where during peak hours on both the 14th and the 18th, there are deliveries of imports that fall 
significantly below the quantities that ultimately were included in the capacity test. The proposal is that the CAISO would uh, use a mechanism similar to other EIM entities to identify the resource before it gets included in the test. And that could be using e-tags, which, which could be a, a pretty straightforward mechanism, or some other form of validation, but the premise being that that should be identified up front before it gets included in the test um, so that it's known ahead of time that it is legitimately available to be delivered. So I'll stop there to see if there are questions or comments on that. Yeah, so Jeff, this is Danny. I think, I think we understand your concern. The, the adder that we have in the capacity test that tries to track deviations on what is shown at T40 and what eventually gets tagged, I think tries to address this concern. Yes, and, and that's, oh, sorry, Danny, continue. No, 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 oh, please go on. Um, yes, I'm aware that there is a, a, an adder that's um, sort of an, uh, analogous to the um, uncertainty for, for load and bears, but I, I know it's a, a different calculation. But the challenge that exists with that is that, in essence, you're looking at average delivery failures using some historical look back to account for uh, a delivery risk that isn't random. You know, it's one thing to, to use an uncertainty calculation associated with wind or with load where you legitimately don't know it's gonna come in high, it's gonna come in low, and you need to account for that uncertainty. And there's, there's really no way for you to validate what's going to happen, so you have to account for that uncertainty. In this case, this is not a random occurrence. This will be most likely to occur during those tight hours because that's exactly when a seller that doesn't have any supply is most at risk of not being able to secure a purchase to ultimately deliver to the CAISO. And so I don't think the, the general buffer is really the appropriate mechanism to cover something that is a more discreet and um, specific risk in the key hours, it seems a lot more straightforward and reliable to uh, actually use the information you have to just validate that that supply is legitimate in the first place. And I do think there are other benefits of that as well, one being that um, it provides information to the CAISO 2 about what BA that supply is coming from, um, which could be helping to avoid any concerns about double counting to the extent that there's transactions coming and going from uh, the CAISO and other EIM entity balancing authority areas. Okay, I, I think I understand where you're coming from. I think getting back to the adder that we have, it's I do want to point out it's not an average. We're looking at it's another 97th percentile over the past three months. So it wouldn't be an average deviation. It would be what is a really bad deviation over the previous uh, period of time. I also okay, kind of I wanted to I, – I, I do want to get your thoughts also on the, the concept of uh, during stress system conditions, if we would expect that's when imports wouldn't show up. I, I recall hearing in the in the workshops and in some of the summer readiness stuff from some of the other EIM entities that they took uh, being a reliable partner really serious and that during stress system conditions there was actually added incentive due to the, the scrutiny and visibility that would be paid attention to your imports during those during those periods of time. So I I don't know, that's just what I heard during that conversation, but it, it does kind of push back a little bit against the idea that during stress conditions, people will be serially not delivering. Well, you're referring to other EIM entities and their transactions, and I, I agree. I'm sure there is, you know, heightened uh, emphasis on on deliveries, and everybody understands the um, the tight system conditions are, are 
important and, and, and that we want to, you know, ensure that we're supporting our neighbors, et cetera. But that's not what I'm referring to here. This is not a transaction from your neighbor. This is you have a third party, a, a marketer, submitting a bid into the HASP. They don't have supply. They don't have a BA. They've just submitted an offer at a price that if they clear, then they'll go see if they can buy it. So it's not about supporting your neighbors or delivering on your obligations. It's to say there are potential for entities to all they've done, the only action they've taken is submitting a bid into the KISO market. They clear, then they go out and they start phoning all of those other BAs and different entities trying to see if they can find some extra supply to fulfill that obligation. That's the risk. Yeah, this is Brad. Uh, something that, that's occurred to me that we haven't really talked about internally is, you know, recently in our um, intertie deviation settlement uh, proposal or, or the, the functionality we recently implemented, we changed the rule that the market won't dispatch an import if an e-tag, um, if there isn't an e-tag with the transmission profile put in by T minus 40. So the T minus 40 test probably doesn't get that information, but when we move the test to T minus 30, it seems like the test um, could be made to look at or, or would just look at um, imports that do have tags submitted with the transmission profile. I, we had some discussions about whether we were going to move that tagging deadline also, and I, I forget where we landed. We, we'd have to double check, but if we if we if the the tagging deadline stays at T minus 40, it seems like the T minus 30 test could just look at imports with a, a, a tag with the transmission profile. We we didn't require the energy profile to be submitted because there was concerns about seams issues. I believe it was uh, BPA slice contracts. People don't know that until uh, like T minus 30. So we got pushback about requiring the energy portion. And, and the point was if someone's putting in a tag with the transmission profile, that, that, that probably is a real resource. So we could look into that. Thanks, Brad. That's a, that's a great point. And I, it sounds as though some of the changes that you've made and that you're referring to might work pretty well with this type of proposal um, and, and hopefully wouldn't be a significant change. But I do think there's a lot of value in, as I mentioned, just using that straightforward validation um, to try to reduce the, the risk of, of seeing some of these failures that we see on the chart here. And it could be that that fits pretty well with what you're describing. Yeah, because uh, we made that change so the market would know imports that weren't tagged, and it would have, and it wouldn't dispatch them, and it, it would have the ability to. Um, uh, it's too late for hash, but it would have the ability to dispatch other fifteen-minute resources to make up for them. Okay, um, can we move to the next slide, please? I apologize, I'm just having a technical issue here. One moment. So while uh, Jeff, figure, uh, working on technical issues, we did get a question from Kathy Anderson from Idaho Power. Does that change, um, that change to only include tags for import, include the KISO VA also? Um, well, it, it is for the ISO VA. We don't dispatch imports in, uh, in other VAAs. Yeah, it's, uh, that was for the, the Cal ISO VAA that our, our, our market wouldn't dispatch imports that, that don't have the tag by T minus 40, the transmission profile. 
Captain. Yeah, so if they got price. scheduled in the if, if if they got if they got scheduled in the HAS and then they don't submit the uh, transmission profile by P minus forty, then in the fifteen minute market they get dispatched down to zero. Thank you, Brad. And and just to clarify, you know, I I think basically what we're proposing is that yeah, this this enhancement would apply to the CAISO in a way that would uh, be more consistent with with the rest of the EIM um, in terms of using most likely ETAGs, but some kind of some kind of methodology for identifying the, the source of the transactions. Well, Jeff, are you able to see the slide? Yes, apologies. I just had a, a, a computer issue here, so I'm just um, working on bringing it back up. Can you just uh, maybe tell me which slide we're on and I can talk while I'm working on my computer problems? Yeah, slide, slide eight, the solar forecast here. Okay, yeah. So, Jeff, Thank you. Uh, Jeff this is Danny. I, I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. I, I know you said a lot of the EIM entities uh, have more assurances than the CAISA do on the deliverability, but do they do they require tags uh, to be include imports and exports on base schedules? I didn't think that they did. I, I, you know, I can't speak for everyone definitively on, in every situation, but I think you know it's pretty common practice across um, the West outside of transactions with the CAISO that uh, to use e-tags. You know, day ahead transactions, as, as an example, the expectation is that those are tagged on a day ahead basis. Hourly transactions that would occur before the EIM is implemented also come with an e-tag. So, you know, base, by the time uh, uh, an entity is submitting base schedules, my understanding is that they're generally looking at their interchange transactions that they've made and typically would use their e-tagging system to do that. So, you know, I think that is generally the way, but there could be some exceptions to that, so I don't want to be too definitive on that, but I think that's, that's generally the approach. Thanks, Jeff. I, I think we'd ask in the, in the comments that stakeholders submit if, if entities would be willing to kind of detail how they how they approach this, that would be appreciated. It would just give us a little more information to understand how the EIM as a whole approaches these import and export schedules. Okay. Um, so this this slide that we're um, looking at here is one uh, about related to solar forecast error, and uh, Guillermo had previously uh, shown some data from the August heat wave last year during the peak hours that showed solar the solar forecast being used in the resource efficiency evaluation being overstated relative to the actual production. And there were really two things that were notable about the data that he was presenting, and that was that one that the, the the magnitude of those errors was large, but also um, it was systemic. It, it looked as though there were almost in virtually all hours of that original period of from last August, the the forecast appeared to be greater than the actual production. So this chart is just a, a look at uh, last week trying to do the same analysis to compare the hour ahead forecast, which is generally my understanding of a similar timestamp for when the capacity test forecast is uh, developed versus the real time dispatch of solar to try to understand whether that data that Guillermo showed earlier was something that was occurring. And, you can see the blue chart, uh, the blue bar charts show the, basically that difference, the forecast error from the hour ahead versus the real-time dispatch. And it looks as though we're seeing a similar outcome where 
There are hours in which there is a pretty significant forecast error, but the other thing that's notable is uh, aside from a handful of hours on a couple of those days, it seems as though the forecast is systemically overstated. And I, this is something that uh, we wanted to raise to suggest that this appears to, to require perhaps a closer look and some enhancements to try to identify, you know, is there something going on here that's leading to um, a, a systemic overstatement at times by large quantities of the solar forecast? Because I would have expected that on an hour ahead basis, your solar forecast would be relatively random. It might be overstated in some hours and understated in others. And uh, this data seems to show that it's systemically in one direction. So um, I just wanted to, to raise this issue and see if the CAISO had any response or thoughts on what might be leading to this issue. Hi, Jeff. So this is Danny. I think, I think one thing that jumped out to me when I, when I saw this slide was this is looking at the hour ahead forecast versus the RTD dispatch. And there is the potential for the variation possibly in the Kaiser to be due to internal congestion and some of that forecasted solar output that isn't able to be utilized. I don't, I, I don't think we've done a deep dive on this yet and can say the extent that that internal congestion may have uh, created this variance, but I, I do think we understand your concern, and to the extent that this is a problem, I think we would want to look at a broader sample and see if there are systemic over forecasts that aren't able to be realized. But then, I guess getting back to the RSD test, this then gets to the deliverability of the capacity that's shown in, in the base schedules and the bid-in capacity, which the RSC isn't checking for right now, which I think your previous point is the capacity that's shown should be available and be usable for dispatch. So it's, it's something that we need to consider. Okay, I, I just realized I think we might be on the wrong slide on the on the uh, presentation. Can we uh, move back a few to the to the solar forecast error chart? Uh, there we go. There we go. Just to make sure we're we're looking at the same thing. Well, uh, you know, I. I I don't want to speculate too much on what the issues are, but I think, you know, and, and I do realize that there could be other issues during periods where the weather is warmer and, and the heat may play a role. But, you know, I think there's a pretty clear need to take a look at this and say, you know, on an hour ahead basis, if you do see that the forecast that is ultimately being used as part of the test is, is, is missing the mark on a sustained basis, is there a mechanism that could be used to uh, to make an adjustment to reflect that. So I, I would yeah, hope I, that there would I be totally that. agree. Okay. I think this is something that that we can look into and see if it's a if it's a systemic problem and to the extent that it is we can work together to try to come up with a with a fix for it. Okay. Um, moving on to the next slide please. This is uh, I have two slides on one topic and I'll just walk through them both because before maybe taking feedback um, on this, because the, the second slide I think is more of a, of a generic uh, place that we to, to discuss this issue. So the, the question that we would like to raise in the discussion is consideration of whether load conformance should be included in the resource efficiency, uh, sufficiency evaluation. And one example of why that might be a, a useful uh, change is to address the solar forecast error we were just talking about on the previous slide. So if you can imagine, let's just assume that that is occurring and there is a significant solar forecast error occurring in real time. My understanding is that load conformance has a number of different uses, but one might be to bias up the load as a means to reflect that overstated renewable forecast and correct for it. And so you can see this top chart where it says market operations. 
that's what the operator might be doing. They see the renewable forecast is too high, they use upward load conformance to correct for that, and the result is that their, their net load that is now being used through the market to, to dispatch resources has been adjusted to reflect those operating conditions that they're seeing. And the challenge right now with the resource sufficiency test is, as we saw on the previous slide, and, and as kind of illustrated at the bottom part of this chart, the overstated or overforecast renewable output will go into the resource sufficiency test. But any adjustment that the operator makes to account for that does not get factored into the capacity test. So the end result is that if the renewable supply is overstated, even if the operator uses load conformance as a means to address that, that does not make its way into the resource sufficiency test, and therefore the net load requirements in the test will be understated. Next slide, please. Now that's just an illustration, but this is a more generic um, slide. And, and basically what we know uh, is that, first of all, load conformance is basically a manual adjustment used by market operators both in the CAISO and in other EIM areas to, for a variety of reasons. It might be adjusting for uh, renewable forecast error, it might be adjusting for load, um, or in the case of the CAISO BA, uh, as you can see in the chart on the right, um, it is very typically used during the net load ramp hours to assist in um, achieving that ramp and trying to um, position resources and schedule imports in a way to manage those ramps. And that chart uh, shows that this is not a, a, a random occurrence, it's, it's a regular occurrence. As you can see, the red and green lines uh, show the hour ahead and 15 minute market conformance that the CAISO operators use on average. And so you can see that on average in the peak hours, there's a thousand megawatts or more of load conformance being used um, every day. And so, as I just mentioned, this is not getting included in the test. And as a result, if you see a situation like this, where in the CAISO BA there is load conformance that is used systematically in the upward direction during those peak hours, that will result in the sufficiency test having a systemic understatement of the forecast that's actually getting used by the market and by the EIM dispatch. And so one consideration is whether the quantity of the load conformance that's being applied in the 15 minute market should also be reflected in the load forecast used for the big range capacity test. And you know, part of the rationale for choosing the 15 minute market is that, that the FMM plays a direct role. It is part of the EIM dispatch itself. It influences how EIM resources are dispatched, including uh, the quantity of EIM transfers that ultimately occur. And one thing that's not on the slide, but is also notable is that it also plays a role in defining the transfer limits during uh, intervals when the sufficiency test fails. So the FMM conformance can influence all of those outcomes. So, so the question is, is it more accurate and more relevant to include the conformance in a way that ensures that the capacity test is reflecting what the operators are actually seeking to dispatch through the market and reflecting those operating conditions. Let's, uh, let's first see if anybody on the speaker line has any questions or comments before I take questions in the queue. Yeah, this is so. This is Brad. Uh, uh, I just I'd make the point though that uh, under the current state 
of the flexible ramping product, where, you know, where we don't have a, a notable flexible ramping product implemented yet, um, using, using the load conformance could lead to some double counting, it seems to me, where, we, where we're uh, double counting a load conformance done to, make, to cover uncertainty. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of the reason the operators uh, do the load conformance during the peak isn't because of forecast error necessarily. It's, it's to ensure we have uh, capacity online to cover uncertainty uh, because, uh, you know, they can't always be uh, confident that the flexible ramping product capacity is deliverable. And then if, if, then if, if we were then to include the load conformance, we would be double counting some of the um, the uncertainty that's already now in the um, in the test. Um, you know, I, I can understand the point if, if load conformance is used solely for uh, forecast there. Then, yeah, if the, if the forecast is off, things we it, it, it's equitable to, to to test to the what what the the tree load is going to be, but but if load conformance is done for other reasons, it might be uh, double counting some of the uncertainty requirements. Jeff, I wanted to I guess follow up on on your concept, just trying to think this through. Would we it, like to the extent that this was something that we would pursue adding? Would it only be load? forecast adjustment in the upwards direction because it would seem like the ability for, for any EAM, BAA to make load forecast adjustments in the downwards direction would potentially make it easier to pass the capacity test. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, I, I think, you know, it would be difficult to, you know, it might be more uh, of a standardized approach to decide, you know, are you including it in both directions or not? Or another option would be to use more of an evaluation of uh, how it's used over time rather than including it in the moment. Maybe it's more of an adjustment that reflects how it's used on average over some period of time. So if the KISO BA tends to use an upward bias as we see here, then upward bias might be included. If a different entity was doing something different from that, then their pattern of bias might get included. Um, I think those are details that remain to be defined depending on whether we think it's appropriate in the first place to reflect this. I think the, the challenge we see just on the surface um, is that you have a market dispatch that is being determined based on a load forecast that is quite a bit higher than, than what is going into the test. That seems to be sort of the, the need that we think should be addressed, but um, I think there's some details there that you raised that we would have to consider pretty carefully. Okay, well, I definitely think this is something that we should think through together and see if we can tease out the forecast or the conformance that's done for forecast versus what's done for other reasons and then how and how we could best potentially include that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to, you know, Brad made the point about uncertainty. And I think this, like I said before, this is really trying to, this is what we're trying to get to is a, a load forecast that reflects expectations in the market and, and dispatch in the market. And if the operators don't feel that the, the dispatch, or I'm sorry, the load forecast is meeting that need, it seems as though adjusting it should be reflected both in the market and in the test to maintain that consistency. It's just a little bit difficult to visualize how it's useful to have a, a systemic difference like this. It just seems as though you're using one load forecast to measure sufficiency, but then basically saying that that test or, or that forecast is not 
something the operator believes in or is comfortable with, and so they modify it through the market. And um, while I understand why they may do that, I, I struggle with you know, having a persistent difference, especially uh, of this type of size. It, it seems like trying to get some consistency there would be valuable. All right, let's, uh, yeah, let's I, check. I, I think this is a good idea. Thank you. It's something that we'll think on. Sorry to interrupt, Danny. We do have a chat question, but um, let, let me see if there's anybody in that question queue before I read out the chat question. Yes, I see two callers in the question queue. Moving on to the first caller. Caller, please go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Hi, Sir Kelly Ellie. Yeah, I, I just want to, I would reiterate that most conforming is used for a plethora of different issues. So in isolation, this makes complete sense. And, and I get it if there's, if there's persistent um, error in there, you want to correct for it. But I think including it in the test, is, this is one of those that would lead to substantial uh, unintended consequences. On the other hand, other hand, if you're trying to bifurcate this one and, and just say this is for pure load versus other issues, that makes sense, but it may cause some form of reporting out of the council. But uh, I think we would need to be very careful with including this one just because, I mean, load conforming is used for system issues, so many different things that this could become problematic. Thank you, Stuart. Go to the next call. Sure. Moving on to the next caller. Caller, please go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Hey, this is Ramon Mitchell with Pacific Corp. Um, on the last joint quarterly meeting, the issue of EIM entities' demand response not being reflected in the balancing test was raised. Consider the possibility of load conformance to impact the demand forecast using the balancing test as well as in the bid range capacity test. On the surface, to adjust one test but not the other seems conceptually problematic. And, and to my first comment there, it, it would also help address the issue that EIM entities are seeing as it concerns demand response and, and being unable to reflect that demand response as they attempt to pass the balancing test. Thank you, Ramon. Yeah, Ramon, this is Danny at the ISO. I, I recognize that the load conformance, if utilized that way, would be able to reflect the, the demand response. But I, I think our objective and what we were trying to get at in, uh, in our slides was that demand response ideally should be better able to be reflected in the tests rather than having to kind of use a, a crude load conformance tool to reflect it. Was there a concrete proposal to allow EM entities to have the demand response reflected in the test? I mean, at this stage, we're not we're not at the concrete proposal stage. This is kind of the issue paper stage of this process. So we're we're highlighting that this is a concern, and we think there'd be value to doing that. And we're looking for feedback on if there's agreement from the stakeholder community, and then ideas of how that could be implemented. While, while we also internally kind of work through how we think it could be implemented. Okay, thank you. I'll put this in the comments. I do not see any further callers in the queue. Okay, so I'll go ahead and read off the chat question. It's from Dan Williams, CES. This is uh, related to the comment about load conformance overlapping with FRP for uncertainty. Has the CAISO seen a meaningful change in load conformance patterns since the minimum FRP constraint and FMM? was implemented in November 2020. I don't know. If Brad, do you want to take that one? Or? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Sure, yeah. Uh, so comment about low conformance overlapping SRP for uncertainty. Has the CAISO seen a meaningful change in low oh, conformance oh, patterns? Yeah. Since the minimum, what's that? 
Does yeah, that would be MRP? for others. Probably, probably Robert or Guillermo. The answer. Okay. Are you guys on? Your line might be mute on your end. Kindly unmute your device if you're talking right now. I'm not sure if they're still on the phone line. I see them on WebEx, but they may have dropped off the line. I can follow up, Dan, on your question. Follow up with you. Maybe you can give me a thumbs up in the chat if that'll work. Okay, so Sharice, nobody else in the queue or? I do not see any further callers in the question queue. Okay, Jeff, do you want to keep going? Sure, and I, I understand we're at the end of the time here. Um, do, you, do I have another couple of minutes to, I think maybe just a couple more comments. Uh, we don't need to go sure. too much longer. I think just to just to tie up the discussion on the load bias, I I, I heard um, a, a comment from Stuart about you know load conformance is used for a number of different reasons and and I understand that I think you know just hearing some of the feedback uh, and the discussion that it leads me to believe that you know maybe one approach we should contemplate is looking at systemic load bias because. If, you know, as an example with the CAISO where there is a repeat pattern that is consistent over time and has been for, I, I think, multiple years at this stage of biasing up the load in a certain shape, that says to me that the, the initial load forecast is not meeting the, the needs of the market and not meeting the needs of the BA operator and reflecting that sy systematic adjustment would more closely align the resource efficiencies load forecast with what the operator believes is needed through the market. And that might be a solution that we could use that would address that issue, but not bring in this concern about, you know, every different issue that might occur in real time and the use of load conformance uh, that may occur sporadically um, having an, uh, an unintended consequence associated with the test. So I think that that's something further to consider and explore. Um, I'm going to just finish on this slide. Um, Ramon mentioned this issue. It's not um, really specific to PowerX, uh, but this is some, so, it, you know, if others want to chime in, please do. But I think the high level concern that came out of the quarterly meeting a couple of weeks ago is that. Just like the CAISO does, there are multiple EIM entities that have uh, demand response programs, and some of them are, are, are significant and meaningful and important to those entities. But there are challenges uh, associated with including them in the EIM software. They're not uh, typically modeled directly in the system, and for that reason, they can't be counted currently towards the sufficiency requirements. And so it ends up that the capacity value and the ability to use these demand response programs is effectively lost if they can't be used in meeting the sufficiency um, test in advance of the hour. And a couple of the details that are associated with that include the 5% the, the threshold in the forecasting system on whether demand response data is incorporated. That's quite high, um, and it can cause even material amounts of demand response not to be getting the data associated with them not to be included. And uh, also just with the telemetry and some of the other technical requirements, it may be difficult to register these resources in the same way you would for a typical participating resource or non-participating resource. And so this is a challenge. I think it sounded from the quarterly meeting like there are multiple BAs um, facing this today, and I think we obviously expect just as an industry to see more demand response in the future. 
And so I think what, uh, what we wanted to just convey at the highest level is that we need to work with the CAISO uh, and work together to try to find a way not only to bring in demand response into the sufficiency test, but also just to have it functioning through all the market processes, whether it's the base scheduling, the load forecasting, and dispatch. It, it all kind of goes together, and so this is something I just think we wanted to emphasize as being important and something that we look forward to more discussion about. Uh, this, this, is Ryan, this is Ryan Moore from Portland General. Um, just, just to tag on to that, I, I think Jeff covered most of it, but this was an issue that, that PGE brought up. Um, using just PGE's demand response program as an example, that, that's about 75 megawatts that's both needed and not properly reflected or accounted for. And the inability to account for that capacity results in the need for EIM entities like PGE to procure capacity or potentially procure that capacity to cover those demand response resources that aren't counted in the RSC, which during a critical time of the year um, arguably contributes to the capacity shortage issues that's facing the region. I think Amber Motley explained in more detail why the 5% threshold wasn't movable for the purposes of load forecasting but I think questions remain regarding why we couldn't look at or better leverage supply side opportunities, namely by allowing EIM entities to reflect their demand resources as um, non-participating resources and leaving the settlement and validation risk on the EIM entities. Um, I think as demand response programs continue to grow across the region per Jeff's point, more discussion on this topic is needed and whether alternatives or solutions um, can be identified. Jeff, do you want to go ahead and finish? I think this is your last slide, and then we can see if there's questions. Sure. And I, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. It, Gary um, raised this earlier in response to some of Danny's materials, but. We have been thinking about emergency actions and, and, and capacity that might be available to an entity and how do you include it. And I think what, what we had contemplated was that emergency capacity associated with things like emergency demand response or other capacity that's not usually available but could be under certain operating conditions uh, should be included in the test once it is met a, some set of criteria that makes it available somehow. And so that could be something like it's been deployed for energy or it's been base scheduled for energy or it's been initialized in such a way that now it's, it's available for market dispatch. These are really similar criteria that, that would be used for basically any other resource. Um, so in the instance of something like an emergency demand response product once whatever the criteria is for that demand response to be now available for use, it could then be included at that point. That's just kind of a conceptual thought about where do we, how do we include some of these um, sources of supply that aren't generally available but might be in specific periods. But I think as, as Gary pointed out, you know, one of the things we're finding a hard time getting our heads around is this issue of, of arming firm load um, because, you know, if we just sort of take a step back, as Gary mentioned before, the, the resource sufficiency evaluation is trying to measure the resources you have to meet your obligations. And so it just seems like from a principled point of view, if you're pointing towards the firm load that you have for curtailment as a means to meet that test, it seems as though really that's an indicator that you, you don't have sufficient resources to meet load, and in fact, you, you think that it might be curtailed. And so I think that, that's a, 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 an area where I think we've found it difficult to visualize why that, that particular action should result in um, supply getting included in the test. But we wanted to include both these on one slide because I think there's a few different topics that are interrelated between, say, reliability demand response or some other program along those lines, as opposed to this arming firm load 
concept that we talked about earlier today. So um, that, that's the last one we had. Um, maybe before I stop and hear any comments or questions, I'll just say thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and to participate. And uh, as I mentioned before, we appreciate this stakeholder initiative, all the data that the CAISO has put out there and the discussion here, and we're looking forward to, uh, to, to more discussion to try to see if we can improve the resource efficiency evaluation. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. We appreciate you guys um, being here today and offering to present. Uh, let's let's go ahead and see if there are any questions uh, before we conclude. I'll go over the agenda for the workshop on Monday, but just want to see if anybody has any questions for Jeff or anything that we brought up today. Again, press pound two to raise your hand. I do not see any questions in the queue. Anyone on the speaker line have any comments? Oh, this is Danny. I just wanted to kind of echo what Jeff said, but thank him for participating and Gary for participating in today's workshop. The, the viewpoints that you offered are valuable and I think will help us all get to a better RSE when we're, when we're completed with this process. So thank you for participating. Anybody in the queue, Shreya? I do not see any callers in the queue as of now. Okay. Well, yeah, I just wanted to bring up the agenda for Monday's workshop. That's uh, from one to five Pacific time on Monday. Um, so the EIM entities um, are going to present on the enhanced transparency, reporting and oversight, um, and also uncertainty in the capacity. The ISO will talk about potential enhancements, excuse me, enhancements to uh, RSC financial consequences, and then the EIM entities will present on failure consequences and opportunity for um, EIM energy assistance. So thank you all very much for participating today. Really appreciate all the feedback. Um, thank you again to the EIM entities for offering to present, and we'll talk to you on Monday. Enjoy your weekend. <laughs>